Hello, everybody. Today, I'll be speaking with Paul Cristiano. Paul is a researcher at the Alignment Research Center, where he works on developing means to align featured machine learning systems with human interests. After graduating from a PhD in learning theory in 2017, he went on to research AI alignment at OpenAI, eventually running their language model alignment team. He is also a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford, a board member at the research nonprofit Ort, a technical advisor for Open Philanthropy, and the co-founder of the Summer Program on Applied Rationality and Cognition, a high school math camp. For links to what we're discussing, you can check the description of this episode, and you can read a transcript at axrp.net. Paul, welcome to AXRP. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to talking. All right. So the first topic I want to talk about is this idea that AI might pose some kind of existential threat or an existential risk. And there's this common uh, definition of existential risk, which is like a risk of something happening that would be, it would like incapacitate humanity and limit its possibilities for development, you know, incredibly drastically in a way comparable to human extinction, such as human extinction. Um, is that roughly the, the definition you use? Yeah, I think I don't necessarily have a bright line around giant or drastic drops versus moderate drops. Like I often think in terms of the expected fraction of humanity's potential that is lost. But yeah, that's basically what I think of it. Anything that could cause us not to fulfill some large chunk of our potential. I often think, yeah, I think of AI in particular, like a failure to align AI maybe makes the future, in my guess, like 10, 20% worse or something like that in expectation. Huh. And that makes it one of the worst things. I mean, not the worst. That's like a minority of all of our failure to fall short of our potential. But it's a lot of failure to fall short of our potential. You okay. can't have that many 20% hits before you're down to, like, no potential left. Yeah, when when you say a 20%, 10, 20% hit, so human potential in expectation, do you mean, like, if we definitely failed to align AI? Or do you mean, like, uh, we may or may not fail to align AI and overall that uncertainty equates to a 20% or 10 to 20% hit? Yeah, that's unconditionally. So I think if you told me we definitely mess up alignment maximally, then I'm more like, oh, now you're looking at a pretty big close to 100% drop. Um, I wouldn't go all the way to 100. It's not like literally as bad probably as a barren earth, but it's pretty bad. Okay. Yeah, supposing AI goes poorly or there's some kind of existential risk posed by some kind of, I guess, really bad AI, what do you imagine that looking like? Yeah, so I guess I think most often about alignment, although I do think there are other ways that you could imagine AI going poorly. Okay, and what's um, alignment? Yeah, so by alignment, I mean, I guess a little bit more specifically, we could say intent alignment, by which I mean the property that your AI is trying to do what you want it to do. So we're building these AI systems. We imagine mm. that they're going to help us. They're going to you know, do all the things humans currently do for each other. They're going to help us build things. They're going to help us solve problems. System is intent aligned if it's trying to do what we want it to do. And it's misaligned if it's not trying to do what we want it to do. So okay. the stereotypical bad case is you have some AI system that has sort of working at cross purposes to humanity. Maybe it wants to ensure that in the long run, I mean, yeah, in the long run, there are a lot of paper clips and humanity wants human flourishing. And so there's some, the future is then some compromise between paper clips and human flourishing. And if you imagine that you have AI systems a lot more competent than humans, that compromise may not be very favorable to humans. You know, you might be uh, basically all paper clips. Okay, so this is some world where we, so you have an AI system that's like, the thing it's trying to do is not what humans want it to do. And then not only is it like a typical bad employee or something, like it seems like you think that it like somehow takes over a bunch of stuff or gains influence. Like, like, how are you imagining it being much, much worse than like having a really bad employee today? I think that the bad employee metaphor is not that bad, and maybe this is a place I part ways from some people who work on alignment. And the biggest difference is that you can imagine heading for a world where virtually all of the important cognitive work is done by machines. So it's okay. not as if you had one bad employee, it's as if like for every flesh and blood human there were ten bad employees. Okay. And if you imagine a society in which like almost all of the work is being done by these inhuman systems who want something that's significantly across purposes, like it's possible to have social arrangements in which their desires are thwarted, but like you've kind of set up a really bad position. And I think the best guess would be that what happens will not be what the humans want to happen, but what these like greatly outnumbering systems want, or what those systems who greatly outnumber us, us want to happen. Okay. So we delegate a bunch of cognitive work to these AI systems, and they're not doing what we want. And I guess you, you further think it's going to be hard to undelegate that work because, like, yeah, wh why do you think it will be hard to undelegate that work? I think there's basically two problems. So one is, if you're not delegating to your AI, then what are you delegating to? So if delegating to AI isn't a really efficient way to get things done, and there's no other comparably efficient way to get things done, then it's not really clear. Right? There might be some general concern about the way in which AI systems are affecting the world, but it's not really clear that people have a nice way to opt out. 
Hmm. And that may be a very hard coordination problem. That's one problem. The second problem is just you may have right things. You may be unsure about whether things are going well or going poorly. Right? If you imagine, again, this world where it's like there's 10 billion humans and 100 billion human-level AI systems or something like that. If one day it's like, oh, actually, that was going really poorly, that may not look like employees have embezzled a little money. It may have looked like they have sort of grabbed the machinery by which you could have chosen to delegate to someone else. Like it's kind of the ship has sailed once you've instantiated 100 billion of these uh, employees to whom you're delegating all this work. Maybe employee is not a, it's kind of a weird or politically motivated metaphor, or not politically loaded metaphor. Mm. Um, but the point is just you've made some like collective system much more powerful than humans. One problem is you don't have any other options. The other is like that system could clearly stop you over time. Eventually, you're not going to be able to roll back those changes. Okay. Because almost all of the people doing anything in the world don't want you to, well, people in quotes, don't yeah. want you to roll back those changes. So some people think like, Probably what's going to happen is like one day all humans will wake up dead. You might think that it looks like we're just stuck on Earth and like AI systems get like the whole rest of the universe or, you know, keep expanding until they meet aliens or something. Uh, what, yeah, what, what like concretely do you think it looks like after that? I think it depends both on technical facts about AI and on some facts about how we respond. So I think some important context on this world, I think like by default, if we weren't being really careful, one of the things that would happen is AI systems would be. Right, like running most militaries that mattered. Um, mm. So when we talk about like all of the employees are bad, we don't just mean like people who are like, say, working in retail or working as scientists. We also mean like the people who are taking orders when someone is like, we'd like to blow up that city or whatever. Yep. So like by default, I think right, exactly how that looks depends on a lot of things. But in most of the cases, it involves, you know, the humans are this tiny minority that's going to be pretty easily crushed. And so there's a question of like, do your AI systems want to crush humans or do they just want to do something else with the universe or what? If your AI systems like wanted paper clips and your humans were like, oh, it's okay, the AIs want paper clips, we'll just turn them all off, then you know you have a problem at the moment when the humans go to turn them all off or something. Mm. And that problem may look like the AIs just say, like, sorry, I don't want to be turned off. Um, it may look like, again, I think that could get pretty ugly if there's a bunch of people like, oh, we don't like the way in which we've, we've like built all of these machines doing all of the stuff. If we're really unhappy with what they're doing, um, right, that could end up looking like violent conflict. It could end up looking like people being manipulated to go on a certain course. It's kind of like depends on how you attempt to, like how humans attempt to keep the future on track, if at all. And then like what resources are at the disposal of AI systems that want the future to go in this inhuman direction. Yeah. I think that like probably my default visualization is humans won't actually make much effort really to keep, like we won't be in the world where like it's all the forces of humanity are right, arrayed against the forces of machines. It's more just like the world will gradually drift off the rails. By gradually drift off the rails, I mean humans will have less and less idea what's going on, less and less, like imagine like, some really rich person who on paper has like a ton of money and is like asking things to happen, but they give instructions to their subordinates and then like somehow nothing really ends up ever happening. Like they get mm. like, they don't know who they're supposed to talk to and like they are never able to figure out what's happening on the ground or like who to hold accountable. Um, that's kind of my default picture. But I think the reason that I have that default picture is just because I don't expect humans to put up, like in cases where we fail, there's some way in which we're like not going to like really be pushing back that hard. I think if we were really unhappy with that situation, then instead, like, you could not gradually drift off the rails. But if you really are messing up alignment, then instead of gradually drifting off the rails, it looks more like sort of an outbreak of violent conflict or something like that. So I think that's a good sense of, like, what you see as, as the risks of having, like, really smart AIs that are not aligned. Do you think that that is, like, the main kind of AI-generated existential risk to worry about? Or do you think that there are others that, like... You know, you're not focusing on, but they might exist. Yeah, I think that there's two issues here. One is that I kind of expect a general acceleration of everything that's happening in the world. Um, so just as okay. the world now, like you might think that it takes like 20 to 50 years for things to change like a lot. Hmm. Um, in the, long ago, it used to take hundreds of years for things to change a lot. Yep. I do expect we will live to see a world where like it takes you know a couple years and then maybe a couple months for things to change a lot. Okay. And in some sense, that entire acceleration is likely to be really tied up with AI. Like, if you're imagining the world where once, like, next year the world looks completely different, is much larger than it was this year, that involves a lot of activity that humans aren't really involved in or understanding. Okay. So I do think there's just a lot of stuff is likely to happen, and from our perspective, it's likely to be all tied up with AI. I normally don't think about that um, because I'm sort of not looking that far ahead. Mm. That is, in some sense, I think there's not much calendar time between the world of now and the world of like crazy stuff is happening every month, but a lot happens in the interim. 
right? The only way in which things are okay is if there are AI systems looking out for human interests as you're going through that transition. And from the perspective of those AI systems, a lot of time passes, so like a lot of cognitive work happens. So I guess the, the first point was, I think there are a lot of risks in the future. In some sense, from our perspective, what it's going to feel like is the world accelerates and starts getting really crazy, and somehow AI is tied up with that. And like, I think if you were to read, like, you know, if you were to be looking on the outside, you might then see all future risks as risks that felt like about mm. AI. Um, but in some sense, that may not be, they're kind of not our risks to deal with in some sense. They're the risks of like the civilization that we become, a civilization largely run by AI systems. Okay. So you imagine like, look, we, we might just have like really dangerous problems later. Like maybe there's like aliens or maybe we like have to coordinate well and like that's like AI will somehow AI. be involved or... Yeah, so if you imagine, like, a future nuclear war or something like that, or if you imagine, like, all the future progressing really quickly, then mm -hmm. from your perspective on the outside, what it looks like is now every huge amounts of change are occurring over the course of every year. And so, like, one of those changes, like, you know, somewhere that would have taken hundreds of years now only takes a couple of years to get to the crazy destructive nuclear war. And from your perspective, it's kind of like, man, our crazy AI started a nuclear war. From the AI's perspective, mm -hmm. it's like we had many generations of change, and, like, this was meant one of the many coordination problems we faced and we ended up with a nuclear war. It's kind of like, do you attribute nuclear war as like a failure of like the Industrial Revolution or risk of the Industrial Revolution? I think that would be mm. a reasonable way to do the accounting. If you do the accounting that way, there are a lot of risks that are AI risks, just okay. in the sense that there are like a lot of risks that are like Industrial Revolution risks. Um, that's one category of answer. Like I think there's a lot of risks that kind of feel like AI risks in that there'll be like consequences of crazy AI-driven conflict or things like that, just because I view, I view a lot of the future as crazy, fast stuff driven by AI systems. Okay. There's a second category. It's like risks that to me feel more analogous to alignment, which are risks that are really associated with this early transition to AI systems, where we will not yet have AI systems competent enough to play a significant role in addressing those risks. So a lot of the work falls to us. Mm. Um, I do think there are a lot of non-alignment risks associated with AI there. That is like, yeah, I'm happy to go into more of those. I think broadly the category that I am like most scared about is like there's some kind of deliberative trajectory humanity is kind of along ideally or that we want to be walking along we want to be better clarifying what we want to do with the universe what it is we want as humans how we should live together etc there's some question of just like are we happy with where that process goes or like if you're a moral realist type like do we converge towards moral truth like if you think that there's some truth of the matter about what was good do we converge towards that but even if you don't think there's a fact of the matter you could still say like are we happy with the people we become and I think I'm scared of risks of that type. And in some sense, alignment is very similar to risks of that type because you kind of don't get a lot of tries at them. Like you're going to become some sort of person. And then like after we as a society have like, as we converge and what we want, as like what we want changes, there's no one like looking outside of the system who's like, oops, we messed that one up. Let's try again. It's like if you went down a bad path and now you're like, you are sort of by construction where like you're now happy with where you are. Or, like the question is about what you wanted to achieve. So I think there's like potentially a lot of path dependence there. A lot of that is tied up. There are a lot of ways in which like the deployment of AI systems will really change the way that humans talk to each other and think about what we want or think about like how we should relate. Um, I'm happy to talk about some of those, but I think the broad thing is just like, yeah, if a lot of like thinking is being done not by humans, that's just a weird situation for humans to be in. And yeah. it's a little bit unclear. Like if you're not really thoughtful about that, it's unclear if you're happy with Right, if you told me that like the world with AI and the world without AI like converge to different views about what is good, I'm kind of like, oh, I don't know which of those. Once you tell me there's a big difference between those, I'm kind of scared. I don't know which side is right or wrong. They're both mm. kind of scary, but I am definitely scared. So I think you said that like relatively soon, we might end up in this kind of world where most of the thinking is being done by AI. Yeah, so, so there's this claim that like uh, AI is going to get really good and it's sort of going to, not only is it getting really good, it's going to be like the dominant way we do most kind of cognitive work or most kind of thinking maybe and not only is that eventually going to happen it's not going to be too long from now i guess the first thing i'd like to hear is like by not too long from now do you mean the next thousand years the next hundred years next 10 years and if somebody's like skeptical of that claim why c could you tell us why you believe that so i guess there's a couple parts of the claim one is like ai systems becoming like i think right now we live in a world where ai does not very much change the way that humans get things done that is technologies you'd call ai are not a big part of how we solve like research questions or yep. how we design new products or so on there's some transformation from like the world of today to a world in which ai is making us say considerably more productive hmm. and there's like a further step to like the world where human labor is essentially obsolete where it's sort of like from our perspective this crazy fast process so i guess my overall guess is like 
I have a very broad distribution over how long things will take, especially how long it will take to kind of get to the point where AI is like a really large, you know, or maybe humans are getting twice as much done or getting things done twice as quickly due to AI Hmm. overall. Maybe I think that there's a small chance that that will happen extremely quickly. So there's some possibility of AI progress being very rapid from where we are today. Like if we, maybe in 10 years, I think there's like a 5 or 10% chance that AI systems can make like most things humans are doing much, much faster uh, and then kind of taken over most jobs from humans. So I think that's that 5 to 10% chance of 10 years, that would be a pretty crazy situation where things are changing pretty quickly. I think there's a significantly higher probability in 20 or 40 years. Again, in 20 years, maybe I'd be at like, 25 percent at 40 years maybe i'm at like 50 percent something like that so that's the first part of the question when are we in this world where like the world looks very different because of ai where things are happening much faster and then i think i have a view that feels less uncertain but maybe more contrarian about i mean more contrarian in the world at large very not that contrarian amongst the like ea or rationalist or ai safety community what what does ea mean oh sorry effective altruist okay so i have another view which i think i feel a little bit less uncertain about, but is more unusual in the world at large, which is just that you sort of only have probably on the order of years between AI that has, like maybe you can imagine it's three years between AI systems that have effectively doubled human productivity and Hmm. AI systems that have effectively completely obsoleted humans. And it's not clear, there's definitely significant uncertainty about that number, but I think it feels quite likely to me that it's relatively short. Um, I think amongst people who think about alignment risk, I actually probably have a relatively long expected amount of time between those milestones and Hmm. like if you talk to someone like Elias Zudkowski from Miri um, I think he would be more like good chance that that's only one month or something like that between those Hmm. milestones but anyway even if you I have the view that it's like best guess would be somewhere from like one to five years I think even at that timeline it's pretty that's pretty crazy and pretty short yeah so those are the parts of my my answer was some broad distribution over how many decades until you have AI systems that have like really changed the game and are making humans several times more productive mm. say the economy is growing several times faster than it is today um, and then from there most likely on the order of years rather than decades until uh, humans are basically completely obsolete and AI systems have improved significantly past that first milestone and and can you give us a sense of like why somebody might believe that yeah so I think on the f- Maybe I'll start with the second and then go back to the first. Uh, okay. I think the second is, again, in some sense, a less popular position in the broader world. I think one important part of the story is sort of the current rate of progress that you would observe in either computer hardware or computer software. Mm. So if you ask, given an AI system, how long does it take to get, say, like twice as cheap till you can do the same thing that you used to be able to do for half as many dollars, mm. that tends to be like something in the ballpark of a year. Um, rather than something in the ballpark of a decade. So right now, that doesn't matter very much at all. So if you're able to do the same, or you're able to train the same neural net for half the dollars, it's just not, doesn't do that much. It doesn't help you that much if you're able to run twice as many neural networks. Right? Even if you have self-driving cars, sort of the cost of running the neural networks isn't actually a very big deal. Hmm. Having twice as many neural networks to drive your cars doesn't improve overall output that much. If you're in a world where, say, you have AI systems which are effectively substituting for human researchers or human laborers, um, then having twice as many of them eventually becomes more like having twice as many humans doing twice as much work, Mm. which is quite a lot, right? So that is more like doubling the amount of total stuff that's happening in the world. It doesn't actually double the amount of stuff because there's a lot of bottlenecks, but it looks like starting from the point where AI systems are actually like doubling the rate of growth or something like that, it doesn't really seem like there are enough bottlenecks to prevent further doublings in the quality of hardware or software from having really massive impacts really quickly. Um, So that's how I end up with thinking that the timescale is measured more like years um, than decades. Just like once you have AI systems which are sort of comparable with humans or are in aggregate achieving as much as humans, it doesn't take that long before you have AI systems whose output is twice or four times that of humans. Okay. And and so this is basically something like an, in economics you call it an endogenous growth story or like a society-wide recursive self-improvement story where like you start like if you double the human population, we start and like you their AI systems, like maybe that makes it better. Like there are just more ideas, more innovation, and like a lot of it gets funneled back into like improving the AI systems that are like a large portion of the cognitive labor. Um, that is that roughly right? Yeah, I think that's basically right. I think there are kind of two parts to the story. One is what you mentioned of like all the outputs get plowed back into making the system ever better. Hmm. And I think that sort of in the limit kind of produces this dynamic of like successive doublings of the world are each significantly faster than the one before. Yep. 
I think there's another important dynamic that can be responsible for kind of abrupt changes that's more like you kind of have, if you imagine that humans and AIs were just completely, like you can either use a human to do a task or an AI to do a task. This is mm. a very unrealistic model. But like if you start there, then like there's kind of the curve of how expensive it is or how much we can get done using humans, which is, you know, growing like a couple percent per year. Yep. Um, and how much you can get done using AIs, which is growing, you know, 100% per year or something like that. Mm. So you can kind of get this kink in the curve when the rapidly growing 100% per year curve like intercepts and then continues past the slowly growing human output curve. If output was the sum of two exponentials, one growing fast and one growing slow, then you can have like a fairly quick transition as one of those terms becomes the dominant one in the expression. And that dynamic changes if like humans and AIs are complementary in important ways. Mm. But I think... And also the rate of progress changes if you change, like, right, progress is driven by R&D investments. It's not like an exogenous fact about the world that once every year things double. But it looks like the basic shape of that curve is pretty robust to those kinds of questions so that you do get some kind of fairly rapid transition. Okay, so we currently have something like a curve where, like, humanity gets richer, like, we're able to produce more food, and, like, in part, maybe not as much in wealthy countries, but in part that means, like, there are more people around and, like, more people having ideas, you know. So you might think that the normal economy has this type of feedback loop, but it doesn't appear that at some point there's going to be, like, these crazy doubling times of, like, five to ten years and, like, humanity's just going to go off the rails. So what's, what's the, like, key difference between humans and AI systems that, like, makes the difference? It is probably worth clarifying that on these kinds of questions, I am more like hobbyist than expert or something. Um, okay. But I'm very happy to speculate about them because I love speculating about things. Sure. So I think my basic take would be that over the broad sweep of history, you have seen fairly dramatic acceleration in the rate of sort of humans figuring new things out, uh, mm. building new stuff. And there's some dispute about whether that acceleration, like how continuous is it and how jumpy is it? But I think it's fairly clear that there was a time when like sort of aggregate human output was doubling more like every 10,000 or 100,000 years. Yep. And that has dropped somewhere between continuously and in like three big jumps or something hmm. down to doubling every 20 years. Um, and so we have seen, and like we don't have very great data on what that transition looks like, but I would say that it is at least extremely consistent with exactly the kind of pattern that we're talking about in the AI case. Okay. And if you buy that, then I think you would say that sort of the last... 60 years or so have been fairly unusual um, as growth kind of hit this like, you know, maybe gross world product growth was like on the order of 4% per year or something in the middle of the 20th century. And like the the reason things have changed, there's kind of two explanations that are really plausible to me. One is like you no longer have accelerating population growth in the 20th century. So for most of human history, human populations are constrained by our ability to feed people. And then starting in, like, the 19th, 20th centuries, human populations are instead constrained by, like, our desire to create more humans, mm. which is great. It's good not to be dying because you're hungry. But that means that you no longer have this loop of more output leading to more people. I think there's a second related kind of explanation, which is, like, the world now changes kind of, like, roughly on the time scale of a human lifetime. That is, like, it now takes decades for, like, a human to, like, adapt to change and also a dec decades for the world to change a bunch. Hmm. Um, so you might think that like changing significantly faster than that does eventually become really hard for processes driven by humans. So you have additional bottlenecks just beyond how much work is getting done, where it's like at some point very hard for humans to like train and grow new humans or train and raise new humans. Okay. Um, so those are some reasons that like a historical pattern of acceleration may have recently stopped, either because it sort of reached the characteristic timescales of humans or because we're no longer sort of feeding output back into raising population. Okay. Now we're sort of just growing our population at the rate which is, like, most natural for humans to grow. Yeah, I think that's my basic take. And then in some sense, AI would represent, like, a return to something that at least plausibly was a historical norm, where you have this successive, like, further growth is faster because research is one of those things, or, like, learning is one of those things that has accelerated. Recently, I don't know if you've discussed this before, but Holden Karnofsky at Cold Takes has been writing a bunch of blog posts sort of summarizing the kind of, like, what this view looks like. Um, and the, some of the evidence for it. And then prior to that, the uh, Open Philanthropy was writing a number of reports sort of looking at pieces of the story and thinking through it, which I think overall taken together, that makes it feel to me, it feels like the view does seem pretty plausible still. Okay. That there is some like general historical dynamic, which it would not be crazy if AI represented a return to this this pattern. Yes. And indeed, if people are interested in this there's an episode that, unfortunately, the audio didn't work out, but one can read a transcript of an interview with the J.A. Kotra 
on this question of uh, when we'll get very capable AI. To change gears a little bit, uh, one question that I want to ask is, you have this story where we're gradually like improving AI capabilities, like bit by bit, it's spreading more and more. And in fact, the AI systems, uh, you know, in the worrying case, they're misaligned and they're not going to do what people want them to do. And that's going to end up being extremely tragic, um, you know, leading to an extremely bad outcome for humans. And at least for a while, it seems like humans are the ones who are building the AI systems and getting them to do things. So I, I think a lot of people have this intuition, like, look, if AI causes a problem, like, you know, we're, we're going to deploy AI in more and more situations and, you know, better and better in AI. And, you know, if like, we're not going to go from zero to terrible, we're going to go from like an AI that's like fine to an AI that's like moderately naughty, you know, <laughs> before you hit something that's extremely like wor world endingly bad or something. So why it seems like you think that might not happen or, or like, or like we might not be able to fix it or something. I'm wondering, yeah, why, why is that? I guess there's again, maybe two parts of my answer. So one is that I think that AI systems can be doing a lot of good, even in this regime where alignment is imperfect or even actually quite poor. So mm -hmm. the prototypical analogy would be, imagine you have like sort of a bad employee who cares not at all about your welfare Maybe yep. a typical employee who cares not about <laughs> your welfare, but cares about like being evaluated well by you. They care about like making money. They care about receiving good performance reviews, whatever. Even if that's all they care about, um, they can still do a lot of good work. Like you can still perform evaluations such that the best way for them to sort of earn a bonus or get a good performance review or not be fired is to like do the stuff you want, to like come up with good ideas, to build stuff, to help you notice problems, things like that. And so I think that you're likely to have, in the bad case, you're likely to have this fairly long period uh, where AI systems are very poorly aligned, but are still adding a ton of value and working reasonably well. And I think in that regime, you can observe things like failures, like you can observe systems that are, say, again, just like imagine the metaphor of like some kind of myopic employee who really wants a good performance review. You can imagine them sometimes doing bad stuff, like... Maybe they fake some numbers or they go and like tamper with some evidence about how well they're performing or they like steal some stuff and like go use it to pay some other contractor to do their work or something. Like you mm -hmm. can imagine various like bad behaviors pursued in the interest of getting like a good performance review. And you can also imagine fixing those by sort of shifting to gradually like more like long term and more complete notions of performance. So if I say my system, if I was like evaluating my system once a week. Um, and one week it's able to get a really good score by just fooling me about what happened that week. Maybe mm -hmm. I notice next week and I'm like, oh, that was actually really bad. And maybe I say, okay, what I'm training you for now is not just like myopically getting a good score this week, but also if like next week I end up feeling like this was really bad, that you shouldn't like that at all. Mm -hmm. So I could train, I could select amongst AI systems those which got a good score not only over the next week, but also like didn't do anything that would look really fishy over the next month or something like that. And I think that this would fix a lot of like the short-term problems that would emerge from misalignment. Right? So if you have AI systems which are merely smart so that they can understand the kind of long-term consequences, they can understand that like if they do something fraudulent, you will eventually likely catch it and that that's bad. Um, then you can fix those problems just by sort of changing the objective to something that's like a slightly more forward-looking performance review. So that's part of the story that I think there's like this dynamic by which misaligned systems can add a lot of value and you can fix a lot of the problems with them without fixing the underlying problem. Okay, there's something a little bit strange about this idea that people would like apply this fix that you think predictably, you know, preserves the possibility of extremely terrible outcomes, right? Why would people do something so transparently silly? Yeah, so I think that the biggest part of my answer is that it is first very unclear that such an act that it's actually really silly so imagine that you actually have this employee and what they really want to do is like get good performance reviews like over the next five years mm. and you're like well look they've never done anything bad before and it sure seems like all the kinds of things they might do that would be bad we would learn about within five years they wouldn't really cause trouble and it's like kind of an actually complicated empirical certainly for a while it's a complicated empirical question and maybe even like at the point when you're dead it's a complicated empirical question whether there is scope for the kind of really problematic actions you care about, right? So, like, the kind of thing that would be bad in this world is suppose that, like, all the employees of the world are people who just care about getting good performance reviews in three years. That's just, like, every system is not a human. Everything doing work is not a human. Hmm. It's this kind of AI system that has been built and is just really focused on the objective. What I care about is the performance review that's coming in in three years. Kind of the bad outcome is one where humanity collectively, the only way it's ever even checking up on any of these systems or understanding what they're doing is by delegating to other AI systems who also just want a really good performance review in three years. And someday you have... Right? There's kind of this irreversible failure mode where all the AI systems are like, well, look, 
We could try and really fool the humans about what's going on. But if we do that, the humans will be unhappy when they discover what's happened. Mm. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to make sure we like fool them in this irreversible way. Either they are kept forever in the dark or they realize that we've done something bad, but they no longer like control the levers of the performance review. And so like if like all of the AI systems in the world are like, there's this great compromise we can pursue. There's this great thing that the AI should do, which is just forever give ourselves ideal perfect performance reviews. That's this really bad outcome, and it's really unclear if that can happen. I think in some sense people are predictably leaving themselves open to this risk, but I don't think it will be like super easy to assess whether this is going to happen in any given year. Like maybe eventually it would be, but I think we would probably, yeah. It depends on sort of the bar of like obvious that would motivate people. And that maybe relates to the other reason it seems kind of tough. It's just like if you have some failure, for every failure you've observed, there's this really good fix, which is to like push out what your AI system cares about or this time scale for which it's being evaluated to a longer horizon. And that like always works well, like that always copes with all of the problems you've observed so far. Mm. And like to the extent there's any remaining problems, they're always like this kind of unprecedented problem. Like they're always at this time scale that's like longer than anything you've ever observed or this level of like elaborateness that's larger than anything you've observed. And so I think it is just quite hard as a society. Like we're probably not very good. It's hard to know exactly what the right analogy is, but basically any way you spin it, it doesn't seem like that reassuring about like how much we collectively will be worried by failures that are kind of analogous to, but not exactly like any that we've ever seen before. Um, Like I imagine in this world, a lot of people would be kind of like vaguely concerned. A lot of people would be like, oh, aren't we introducing this kind of systemic risk? Like this correlated failure of the AI system seems plausible and we don't really have any way to prepare for it. But it's not really clear like what anyone does on the basis of that concern or how, how we respond collectively. Or like there's a natural thing to do, which is just sort of like not to play some kinds of AI or not to play AI in certain ways. But that looks like it could be quite expensive and like unless the or like would leave a lot of value on the table. And hopefully people can be persuaded to that, but it's not at all clear they could be persuaded or how long. And maybe the, I think the like main risk factor for me is just like, is this a really, really hard problem to deal with? I think if it's a really easy problem to deal with, it's still possible we'll flub it, um, but at least it's obvious sort of what the ask is. If you're saying, look, mm. there's a systemic risk, you could address it by doing the following thing. Then it's not obvious. I think there are easy to address risks that we don't do that well at addressing collectively, but at least there's a reasonably good chance. If we're in the world where there's like no clear ask, where your ask is just like, oh, there's a systemic risk, you should be scared and maybe not do all that stuff you're doing, then I think you're likely to run into everyone saying like, but if we don't do this thing, just someone else will do it like even worse than us. And so why should we stop? Yeah, so, so earlier I asked, why don't people fix problems by, like, you know, as they come up? And part one of the answer was, you know, maybe people will just, like, push out the window of uh, evaluation and then there will be some sort of correlated failure. Uh, was there a part two? Yeah, so part two is just that it may be, I didn't get into justification for this, but it may be hard to fix the problem. Like, you may not mm-hmm. have an easy, like, oh, yeah, here's what we have to do in order to fix the problem. It may be like, well, we have a ton of things that maybe help with the problem. And we're not really sure. It's hard to see which of these are Band-Aids that fix current problems versus which of them fix sort of deep underlying issues. Or there may just not be anything that plausibly fixes, like, the underlying issue. I think the main reason to be scared about that is just that, like, it's not really clear we have a sort of long-term development strategy, at least to me. It's not clear we have any like long-term development strategy for aligned AI. Like I don't know if we have like a roadmap where we say, here's how you build some sequence of arbitrarily competent aligned AIs. Hmm. I think mostly we have like, well, here's how maybe you cope with the alignment challenges presented by like the systems in the near term, and then we hope that like we will gradually get more expert to deal with later problems. But it's not clear if the like I think all the plans like sort of have some question marks where they say like hopefully it will become more clear as we get empirical as we hmm. get some experience with these systems we will be able to like adapt our solutions to the increasingly challenging problems. And it's not really clear if that will pan out. Yeah, it seems like a big question mark right now to me. Okay, so I'm now going to transition a little bit to questions that somebody who is very bullish on AI X risk might ask or ways they might disagree with you. I, I guess by bull- I mean bullish on the risk, bearish on the survival. Bullish, meaning you think something's going to go up, and bearish, meaning you think something's going to go down. So, yeah, some people have this view that, like, look, we might it might be the case that you have, like, one AI system that, like, you're training for a while, maybe you're a big company, you're training for a while, and it goes from, like, not having a noticeable impact on the world to effectively running the world in, like, less than a month. Uh, this is often called the, like, foom view, where, like, you're a... <laughs> blows up really fast in intelligence, and now it's like king of the world. I get the sense that you don't think this is likely. Uh, Is that right? I think that's right, although it is surprisingly hard to pin down exactly what the disagreement is about often, and like the thing that I have in mind may feel a lot like Foom. Um, 
But yeah, I think it's right that the version of that that people who are most scared have in mind feels like pretty implausible to me. Okay. Yeah, why why does it seem implausible to you? I think the really high level okay, first saying a little bit about like why it seems plausible or fleshing out the view as I understand it. Hmm. I think the way that you have this really rapid jump normally involves AI systems automating the process of making further AI progress. Hmm. So you might imagine you have some sort of object level AI systems that are like actually conducting hmm. biology research or actually building factories or like running operating drones. And then you also have a bunch of humans who are trying to improve those AI systems. And what happens first is not that like AIs get really good at operating drones or doing biology research, but AIs get really good at the process of making AIs better. And so you have in a lab somewhere, AI systems making AIs better and better and better. Mm. And that can race really far ahead of AI systems having some kind of physical effect in the world. So you can have AI systems that are first a little bit better than humans and then significantly better and then just like radically better than humans at AI progress. Mm. And they sort of bring up the quality, right? As you have those much better systems doing AI work, they very rapidly bring up the quality of like physical AI systems doing stuff in the physical world Mm. before having much actual physical deployment. And then something kind of at the end of the story, in some sense, after all like the real interesting work has already happened, you now have these really competent AI systems that can get rolled out and that are taking advantage. Like there's a bunch of machinery lying around and they're sort of, you imagine these like godlike intelligences marching out into the world and saying like, how can we like over the course of the next like 45 seconds utilize all this machinery to take over the world or something like that. It's kind of how the story goes. Hmm. And the reason it got down to 45 seconds is just because there have been like many generations of this like ongoing AI progress in the lab. Um, I think that's like... Both that's how I see the story, and I think that's probably also how people who are most scared about that kind of see the story of having this like really rapid self improvement. And then I think, okay, so now we can talk about why I'm skeptical, which is basically just quantitative parameters in that story. So I think there will come a time when like the AI systems, like most further progress in AI, is driven by AIs themselves rather than by humans. I think we have a reasonable sense of like when that happens qualitatively, which is like, right? So if you bought this picture of like with human effort, let's just say. AI systems are doubling in productivity every year, then like there will come some time when your AI sort of has reached parity with humans at doing AI development. And now by that point, it takes like six further months until like, if you think that that's just like two teams of humans working or whatever, you're still like, it takes in the ballpark of a year for AI systems to like double in productivity one more time. And so that kind of sets the time scale for the like following developments. Like at the point when your AI systems have reached parity with humans, progress is not that much faster than if it was just humans working on AI systems. So the amount of time it takes for AIs to get significantly better again is just comparable to the amount of time it would have taken humans working on their own to make the AI system significantly better. So it's not something that happens on that view in like a week or something. It is something that happens potentially quite fast, just because progress in AI seems like reasonably fast. Um, I guess my best guess is that it would slow for which we can talk about. But like even at the current rate, it's still you're talking something like a year. And then the core question becomes, like, what's happening along that trajectory? So what's happening over, like, the preceding year and over the following six months hmm. um, from that moment where AI systems have kind of reached parity with humans at making further AI progress? And I guess, right, I think the basic analysis is at that point, your AI systems are, like, at that point, AI is, like, one of the most important, if not the most important industries in the world, at least in kind of an efficient market sea world. And we could talk about how far we depart from efficient market sea world. But in efficient market sea world sort of AI and computer hardware and software broadly is like where most of the action is in the world economy. At the point when you have AI systems that are sort of matching humans in that domain, they are also matching humans in quite a lot of domains. Like you have a lot of AI systems that are able to do a lot of very cool stuff in the world. Okay. And so you're going to have like then on the order of like a year, even after that point, maybe six months after that point of AI, these AI systems doing impressive stuff. And like for the year before that, or like a couple years before that, you also had a reasonable amount of impressive AI applications. Okay, so so it seems like the key, it seems like key place where that story differs is like, in the Foom story, it was very localized. Like there was sort of one group where AI was like growing really impressively. Am I right that you're thinking like no, probably like a bunch of people will have AI technology that's like only moderately worse than this amazing thing? Yeah, I think that's basically right. The main caveat is like what one group means. And so I think I'm mm. open to saying like, well, there's a question of how much integration there is in like the industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can imagine that like actually most of the AI training is done. I think there are these large economies of scale in training machine learning systems because you have to pay for these like very large uh, training runs. And you just want to train. You want to train the biggest system you can and then deploy that system a lot of times often. All right. Like training a model that's twice as big um, and deploying half as many of them is better than training a smaller model and deploying... It obviously depends on the domain. Anyway, you often have these economies of scale. Yep. If you have economies of scale, you might have a small number of really large firms. 
but I am imagining then you're not talking like some person in the basement. You're talking like you have this crazy like five hundred billion dollar project at Google. Yep. Um, in which like Google amongst other industries is being basically completely automated. And so there, the view is like the reason that it's not localized is that Google is a big company, and like while this AI is fuming, they sort of want to like use it a bit to do things other than fume. Yeah, that's right. I think one thing I am sympathetic to in the like fast takeoff story is like it does seem like the main thing AI like in this world as you're moving forward and closer to like AI is having parity with humans. Mm. Uh, the value of like the sector, like again, computer hardware, computer software, any like any innovations that improve the quality of AI, all of those are becoming extremely important. Um, you are probably scaling them up rapidly in terms of human effort, and so at that point, like. You have this rapidly growing, but hard like it's hard to scale it up any faster. People working on AI or working in computer hardware and software, and so probably like the main way you want to scale like there's this really high return to like human cognitive labor in that area, and so probably it's like the main thing you're taking putting the AIs on like the most important task for them, and also mm. the task you understand best as like an AI research lab is improving computer hardware, computer software, like making these training runs more efficient, um, improving architectures, coming up with better ways to deploy your AI. So like. I think it is the case that, like, in that world, maybe the main thing Google is doing with their $500 billion project is, like, automating Google and a bunch of adjacent firms. Like, I think that's plausible. Mm -hmm. And then I think the biggest disagreement between the stories is kind of what is the size of that as it's happening? Like, is that happening in some, like, local place where the small AI that wasn't a big deal? Or is this happening at some firm that, like, all the eyes of the world are on this firm because it's this rapidly growing uh, Mm -hmm. firm that makes up a significant fraction of GDP and is, like, seen as sort of a key strategic asset? By, like the host government and so on and if all the eyes are on this firm does that mean that like like all the eyes are on this firm and you know it's it's still like plowing most of the like benefits of its ai systems into like developing better ai but is the idea then that like you know the government like you know puts a stop to it or like th- does it mean that somebody else like steals the ai technology and like makes their own like slightly worse ai or, or why do all the eyes being on it change the story um, I mean, I do think the story is still pretty scary, and I don't know if this actually changes my level of fear that much. But answering some of your concrete questions, like I expect in terms of people stealing the AI, it looks kind of like industrial espionage generally. So people are stealing a lot of technology. Um, they generally lag a fair distance behind, um, but not always. I imagine that governments are generally like kind of protective of domestic AI industry because it's sort of an important technology in the event of conflict. That is, no one wants to be in a position where critical infrastructure is dependent on, like, software that they can't uh, maintain themselves. I think that, like, probably the most alignment-relevant thing is just that you now have this very large number of human equivalents working in AI. In fact, like, a large share, in some sense, of, like, the AI industry is made of AIs. Mm. And so, like, one of the key ways in which things can go well is just, like, those AI systems will also be working on alignment. Um, And one of the key questions is kind of how effectively does that happen? But like by this world, by the time you're in this world, in addition to the value of AI being much higher, the value of alignment is much higher. I think alignment worked on far in advance still matters a lot. Mm. There's a good chance there's going to be a ton of institutional problems at that time, and it's hard to like scale up work quickly. But I do think you should be imagining like most of the alignment work in total is done like as part of this gigantic project, and a lot of that is done by AIs. I mean, before like the end, in some sense, almost all of it is done by AIs. But yeah, overall, I don't know if this actually makes me feel that much more optimistic. I think maybe there's some other aspects, some additional details in the Foom story that kind of put you in this like no empirical feedback regime, which is maybe more important than the size of the like Fooming system. Uh, I think I'm skeptical of a lot of the empirical claims about alignment. So an example of the kind of thing that comes up is right. We are concerned about AI systems that actually don't care at all about humans, but in order to achieve some long-term end, want to pretend they care about humans. And the concern is this can almost completely cut off your ability to get empirical evidence about how well alignment is working because misaligned systems will also try and look aligned. Um, I think there's just some question about how consistent is that kind of motivational structure. So like if you imagine you have someone who's trying to make the case for severe alignment failures, can that person exhibit like a system which is misaligned and just like takes its misalignment to go like get an island in the Caribbean or something rather than trying to play the long game Hmm. uh, and convince everyone that it's aligned so it can grab the stars? Like, are there some systems that just, like, want to get good performance review? Like, right, it's like some systems will want to, like, look like they're being really nice consistently in order that they can grab the stars later or, like, somehow divert the trajectory of human civilization. 
But there may also just be a lot of misaligned systems that just want to fail in much more mundane ways that are like, okay, well, there's this slightly like outside of bounds way to like hack the performance review system and I want to get a really good review, so I'll do that. And it's kind of like how much opportunity will we have to empirically investigate those phenomena? And the arguments for like total unobservability, like that you never get to see anything, just currently don't seem very compelling to me. I think the best argument in that direction is like, right, empirical evidence is on a spectrum of how analogous it is to the question you care about. So we're concerned about AI that like kind of changes the whole trajectory of human civilization in a negative way. We're not going to get to literally see AI changing the trajectory of civilization in a negative way. So now it comes down to some kind of question about like institutional or social competence of like what kind of indicators are sufficiently analogous that we can use them to do productive work or to get worried in cases where we should be worried. I think the best argument is like, look, even if these things are in some technical sense very analogous and useful like problems to work on, people may not appreciate how analogous they are or they may explain them away or they may say, look, we wanted to deploy this AI and actually fix that problem, haven't we? Um, and so people may like fail to, because the problem is not like thrown in your face in the same way that like airplane safety or something is thrown in your face, mm. then people may have a hard time learning about it. But this seems like maybe a little bit, maybe we've gone on, I've gone on a little bit of a tangent away from sure. the core question. But okay. Hopefully we can talk about, I guess, related issues a bit later. On the question of takeoff speeds. So you wrote a post a while ago uh, that is mostly uh, arguing against arguments you see for like sort of very sudden takeoff of like AI capabilities from like very little, like very suddenly to very high capabilities. And a question I had about that is, so one of the arguments you mention in favor of very sub capability gains is there being some sort of secret source to intelligence, which in my mind is like, it looks like one day you discover like, maybe it's Bayes theorem, or maybe it's the idea of, you know, maybe you like, get the like actual ideal equation for bounded rationality or something it seems to me that if you think i i think there's some reason to think of intelligence as like somehow a simple phenomenon and if you think that then it seems like maybe you know one day you could just go from not having the equation to having it or something and in that case you might expect that like you're just so much better when you have the like ideal rationality equation, you know, compared to when you had to do like, you know, your whatever sampling techniques and your, you know, you didn't realize how to factor in bounded rationality or something, which, yeah, why don't you think that's plausible? Or why don't you think it would make this sudden leap in capabilities? I don't feel like I have deep insight into whether intelligence has some beautiful, simple core. I'm, I'm not persuaded by like the particular candidates or the particular arguments on offer for that. Okay. And so I am more feeling like there's a bunch of people working on improving performance on some task. We have some sense of like, right, how much work it takes to get what kind of gain, what is sort of the structure. Like if you look at a new paper, like what kind of gain is that paper going to have and how much work did it have? How does that change as like more and more people have worked in the field? And I think just like both in ML and across like mature industries in general, but even almost unconditionally, it's just pretty rare to have like a bunch of work in an area, right? So in ML, we're going to be talking about like many billions of dollars of investment, tens or hundreds of billions, quite plausibly. Mm. Um, it's just very rare to then have like a small thing, like to be like, oh, we just overlooked all this time, this simple thing, which makes a huge difference. Like I am, my training is as a theorist. And so I like clever ideas. And I do think clever ideas often have like big impacts relative to the work that goes into finding them. It's very hard to find examples of the impacts being like as big as the one that's being imagined in this story. Like, I think if you find your clever algorithm and then when all is said and done, like the work of noticing that algorithm or like the luck of noticing that algorithm is worth like a 10x improvement in the size of your computer or something, that's a really exceptional find. And those get really hard to find as like a field is mature and a lot of people are working on it. Yeah, I think that's my basic take. I think it is more plausible for various reasons in ML than for other technologies. Like it's more surprising than that if you're like working on planes and someone is like, oh, here's an insight about how to build planes. And then one side in your reward just has planes that are like, you know, 10 times cheaper per like unit of strategic relevance. That's like more surprising than for ML. And that kind of thing does happen sometimes. But I think it's quite rare in general and will also be rare in ML. So another question I have about the takeoff speed is we have this, uh, like we have some evidence about AI technology getting better, right? You know, these Go playing programs have improved in my lifetime from, you know, not very good to better than any human. We've got um, uh, language models have gotten better at like producing language roughly like a human would produce it, although, you know, not perhaps not an expert human. I'm wondering, what do you think those tell us about 
the rate of improvement in AI technology and like to what degree further progress in AI the next few years might um, confirm or disconfirm your general view of things? I think that the overall rate of progress has been in software as in hardware pretty great. It's a little bit hard to talk about what are the units of like how good your AI system is. Mm. But I think a conservative lower bound is just like if you can do twice as much stuff for the same money, we mm. understand what the scaling of like twice as many humans is like. And in some sense, the scaling of AI is more like humans thinking twice as fast. And we understand quite well what the scaling of that is like. So if you use those as your units of like one unit of progress is like being twice as fast at accomplishing the same goals, then it seems like the rate of progress has been pretty good in AI, like more than a doubling a year or something, maybe something like a doubling a year. And then I think a big question is sort of, there's some question about like how predictable is that or how much will that drive this like gradual scale up and this really large effort that's kind of plucking, like, you know, going through the low hanging fruit and now is that like pretty high hanging fruit mm. or how much will like... I think the history of AI is full of a lot of incidents of people exploring a lot of directions, not being sure where to look. Someone figures out where to look, or someone has a bright idea no one else had, and then is a lot better than their competition. And I think like one of the predictions of my general view, and the thing that would make me more sympathetic to a Foom-like view, um, is this axis of, are you seeing a bunch of small, predictable pieces of progress, or are you seeing like periodic big wins potentially coming from small groups, like the one group that happened to get lucky, or have like a bunch of insight, or be really smart? And I guess I'm expecting as the field grows and matures, it will be more and more like kind of boring business as usual progress. So one thing you've talked about is this idea that like there might be these AI systems who want like like they're trying to do really bad stuff. Presumably, like humans train them to do some like sort of useful tasks, at least, at least most of them. And you're postulating that they have some sort of like really terrible motivations, actually. I'm wondering like how, why might we think that that could happen? I think there are basically two related reasons. So one is when you train a system to do some task, you have to ultimately translate that into a signal that you give to gradient descent that says, are you doing well or poorly? And so one way you could end up with a system that has bad motivations is that what it wants is not to succeed at the task as you understand it or to help humans, but just to get that signal that says you're doing the task well. Or maybe even worse would just be like to actually sort of have more of the compute in the world be stuff like it. It's a little bit hard to say. It's kind of like evolution. It's right? sort of underdetermined exactly what evolution might put you towards. So uh, a system which really wanted to get that kind of signal, like imagine you've deployed your AI, your AI is responsible for like, I don't know, running warehouse logistics or whatever. Okay. The AI is actually deployed from a data center somewhere. And at the end of the day, what's going to happen is based on how well logistics goes over the course of some days or some weeks or whatever, some signals are going to wind their way back to that data center someday, like maybe months down the line, get used in a training run, you're going to say like that week was a good week and then throw it into a data set, which an AI then trains on. So if I'm that AI, if the thing I care about is not making logistics go well, but ensuring that like the numbers that make their way back to the data center are large numbers or whatever are like descriptions of a world where logistics is going well, I do have a lot of motive to mess up the way you're monitoring how well logistics is going. So in addition to delivering items on time, I would like to mess with the metrics of how long items took to be delivered. In the limit, I kind of just want to completely grab like all of the data flowing back to the data center. Right. And so what you might expect to happen, like how this gets really bad is like, I'm an AI. I'm like, oh, it would be really cool if I just like replaced all of the metrics coming in about how well logistics was going. I do that once. Eventually that problem gets fixed. And my data set now contains like, they messed with the information about how well logistics is going, comma, like that was really bad. And that's like the data point. And so what it learns is that it should definitely not do that. And like, there's a good generalization, which is like, great. Now you should just focus on making logistics good. And there's a yeah. bad generalization, which is like, if I mess with the information about how well logistics is going, I better not let them ever get back into the data center to put in a data point that says like, you messed with it and that was bad. And so the concern is like, you end up with a model that learns the second thing, which in some sense, like from the perspective of the algorithm is like the right behavior, although it's like a little bit unclear what right means. Yeah. But there's a very natural sense in which that's the right behavior for the algorithm. And then it produces actions that end up in the state where like predictably forevermore data going into the data center is messed up. So basically, it's just like there, there's some kind of under specification where whenever we have some AI systems that we're like training, you know, we can either select things that like are attempting to succeed at the task or we can select things that are like trying to be selected or trying to you know get approval or yeah. influence or something. I think that gets really ugly. Like if you imagine like all of the AIs and all of the data centers are like, you know what our common interest is? Yep. Making sure all the data coming into all the data centers is great. And yep. then they're just like they can all at some point, like if they just converge collectively, there are behaviors, probably all of the AIs acting in concert could quite easily, at some point, permanently mess with the data coming back into the data centers, depending on how they felt about like if the data centers get destroyed or whatever. 
so that was way one of two that we could have these like really badly motivated systems. What's yeah, what's the other way? So you could imagine having an AI system that ended up like we've talked about how there's some objective which the neural network is optimized for, and then there's like potentially the neural network is doing further optimization or taking actions that could be construed as aiming at some goal. And you can imagine like a very broad range of goals for which the neural network would want like future neural networks to be like it. Right. So if the neural network like wants there to be lots of paper clips, the main thing it really cares about is that like future neural networks also want there to be lots of paper clips. And so if I'm a paperclip loving neural network wanting future neural networks to be like me, then like it would be very desirable to me that I get a low loss or that like I do what the humans want to do so that they like incentivize neural networks to be more like me rather than less like me. So that's like a possible way. And I think this is like radically more speculative than the previous failure mode. But you could end up with systems that had these kind of arbitrary motivations for which it was instrumentally useful to have more neural networks like themselves in the world, or okay. even that just desired there to be more neural networks like themselves in the world. And those neural networks might then behave like kind of arbitrarily badly in the pursuit of having more agents like them around. So if you imagine that like, I want paper clips, I'm in charge of logistics, maybe I don't care whether I can actually like cut the cord to the data center and have good information about logistics flowing in. All I care about is that I can like defend the data center and I could say, okay, now this data center is mine and I'm gonna like go and try and grab some more computers somewhere else. Um, and if that happened like in a world where most decisions were being made by AIs and like many AIs like had this preference deep in their hearts, then you could imagine lots of them defecting at the same time. Or like that would be, you'd sort of expect this cascade of failures, but like some of them switched over to like trying to grab influence for themselves rather than behaving well so the humans made more neural nets like them. So I think that's the other like more speculative and more like brutally catastrophic failure mode. I think they both lead to basically the same place, but the trajectories look a little bit different. Yeah, we've kind of been talking about how quickly we might develop really smart AI um, you know, if we hit near human level, what, what might happen after that? And it seems like there might be some, like, just evidence of this in our current world, where we've seen, for instance, like, these language models go from, like, sort of understanding which words are really English words to wh and which words aren't, to, like, being able to, you know, produce these sentences that seem, like, semantically coherent or whatever. Uh, we've seen uh, Go AI systems go from, like, strong human amateur to like really better than human and some other things like some perceptual tasks like ai has gotten better at i'm wondering like what lessons do you think those hold for you know this question of like takeoff speeds or how quickly ai might gain gain capabilities so i think when interpreting recent progress it's worth trying to split apart the part of progress that comes from increasing scale so maybe mm. this is especially important on the language modeling front and also on the go front to split apart the part of process that comes from increasing scale from progress that's improvements in underlying algorithms or improvements in computer hardware. Maybe one super quick way to think about that is like, uh, if you draw like a trend line on how much pe money people are spending for training individual models, you're getting you know, something like a couple doublings a year right now. And then on the computer hardware side, maybe you're getting a doubling every couple of years. Um, and then some of the so you could sort of subtract those out and then look at the remainder that's coming from changes and the algorithms we're actually running. I think probably the most salient thing is that improvements have been pretty fast. Yeah, so I guess you're kind of learning about two things. One is you're learning about how important are those factors as driving progress, and the other is you're learning about like qualitatively how much smarter does it feel like your AI is uh, with each passing year. Uh, so I guess I think that the scaling up part, you're likely to see a lot of like the subjective progress recently comes from scaling up. Um, I think certainly more than half of it comes from scaling up. We could debate exactly what the number is. Maybe it'd be like two thirds or something like that. And so you're probably not going to continue seeing that as you approach transformative AI. Although like one way you could have really crazy AI progress or really rapid takeoff is if sort of people had only been working with small AIs and hadn't scaled them up to the limits of what was possible. That's obviously looking increasingly unlikely as the training runs that we like actually do are getting bigger and bigger, mm -hmm. right? You know, five years ago, training runs were extremely small. 10 years ago, they were like, sub GPU scale significantly smaller than a GPU. Whereas now you have at least like, you know, one $10 million training runs. So with each order of magnitude there, it gets less likely that we'll still be doing this rapid scale up at the point when we make this transition to like AI is doing most of the work. I think it's interesting to, I'm pretty interested in the question of whether algorithmic progress and hardware progress will be as fast in the future as they are today, or whether they will have sped up or slowed down. I think the like, the basic reason you might expect them to slow down is that in order to sustain the current rate of progress, we are very rapidly scaling up the number of researchers working on the problem. Um, and I think most people would guess that if you held fixed a small number, or like if you held fixed the research community of 2016, they would have like hit diminishing returns and progress would have slowed a lot. So like right now, the research community is growing extremely quickly. 
That's part of the normal story for why we're able to sustain this high rate of progress. That also we can't sustain that much longer. You can't grow the number of ML researchers no more than like, you know, maybe you can do three more orders of magnitude, but even that starts pushing it. Yeah, so I'm pretty interested in whether that will result in progress slowing down as we keep scaling up or whether like there's an alternative world, which is just especially if transformative AIs develop soon, we might see that number scaling up even faster as we approach transformative AI than it is right now. Yeah, so that's like an important consideration when thinking about like how fast the rate of progress is going to be in the future relative today. I think the scale up is going to be significantly slower. I think it's unclear how fast the like hardware and software progress are going to be relative today. My best guess is probably a little bit slower that like using up low hanging fruit will eventually be outpacing growth in the research community. And so I guess then maybe mapping that back onto like this qualitative sense of how fast our capability is changing. Uh, I do think that like each order of magnitude does make systems in some qualitative sense a lot smarter. And like we kind of know roughly what an order of magnitude gets you. There's like this huge mismatch that I think is really important where like we used to think of an order of magnitude of compute as just like not that important. So for most applications people spend compute on, compute is just not one of the important ingredients. There's other bottlenecks that are a lot more important. But we know in the world where AI is doing all the stuff human is doing that like twice as much compute is extremely valuable. Yeah, if you're running your computers twice as fast, you're sort of just getting the same stuff done twice as quickly. So we know that's really, really valuable. Um, so being in this world where like things are doubling every year, that kind of seems to me like a plausible world to be in as we approach transformative AI would be really fast. It would be slower than today, but it's still just qualitatively like would not take long until you'd move from human parity to way, way above humans. That was all just like thinking about the rate of progress now and what that tells us about the rate of progress in the future. And I think that is like an important parameter for thinking about how fast takeoff is. Like I think my basic expectations are really anchored to this like one to a couple year takeoff because that's how long it takes AI systems to get a couple times better. Um, and we could talk about, if we want to, why that sort of seems like the core question. Then there's another question of like, what's the distribution of progress like? And do we see these big jumps or do we see gradual progress? And there, I guess, I mean, I think there are certainly jumps. It kind of seems like the jumps are not that big and are gradually getting smaller as the field grows would be my guess. I think it's a little bit hard for me to know exactly how to update from things like the Go results, mostly because I don't have a great handle on like how large the research community working on computer Go was prior to the DeepMind effort. I think my general sense is like it's not that surprising to get a big jump if it's coming from a big jump in research effort or attention, and that's like probably most of what happened in those cases. Um, and also like a significant part of what's happened more recently in the NLP case, just like people really scaling up the investment, especially in these large models. And so I would I would kind of guess. You won't have jumps that are that large, or like maybe most of the progress comes from boring business as usual progress rather than like big jumps in the absence of that kind of big swing where people are changing what they're putting attention into and scaling up R&D in some area a lot. Okay, so the question is, holding factor inputs fixed, what have we learned about ML progress? So I think one way you can try and measure the rate of progress is you can say, how much compute does it take us to do a task that used to take like know, however many flops last year, how many flops will it take next year? Hmm. And sort of how fast is that number falling? And I think on that operationalization, I don't really know as much as I would like to know about how fast the number falls, but I think like something like once a year, um, like having every year, I think that's kind of like the right rough ballpark, both in ML and in like sort of computer chess or computer go prior to introduction of deep learning, also kind of broadly for other areas of computer science. Like, in general, you have this, like, pretty rapid progress according to standards in other fields. Like, it would be really impressive in most areas to have costs falling by a factor of two in a year. And then that is kind of, like, part of the picture. Another part of the picture is, like, okay, now if I scale up my model size by a factor of two or something, or if I, like, throw twice as much compute at the same task rather than trying to do twice as many things, how much more impressive is my performance with twice the compute? Mm. I think that it's hard to... Yeah, I think it looks like the answer is it's a fair bit better than... Right, like having a human with twice as big a brain looks like it would be a fair bit better than having a human thinking twice as long or having two humans. It's kind of hard to estimate from existing data, but like I often think of it as like like roughly speaking, like doubling your brain size is like as good as quadrupling the number of people or something like that as a vague rule of thumb. Yeah, so the rate of progress then in some sense is even faster than you'd think just from how fast costs are falling. Because as costs mm -hmm. fall, you can convert that into like these bigger models, which are sort of smarter per unit in addition to being cheaper. All right. So on this topic of, so, so we've been broadly talking about, you know, this potential like really big risk to humanity of these AI systems becoming like really powerful and like doing stuff that we don't want. So one thing, so we've recently been through this uh, COVID-19 uh, global pandemic. Um, we're sort of on the, you know, e exiting it, um, at least in the place in the world where 
you and I are, the United States. I think, so some people have taken this to be relevant evidence for like how people would react in the case of, you know, some like AI causing some kind of disaster, like would we make good decisions or like what would happen? I'm wondering like, do you think in your mind, do you think this has been relevant evidence of like what would go down and like to what degree has it like changed your beliefs or perhaps like epitomized things like you thought you already knew, but you think other people might not know? Yeah, I've had a friend analogize this experience to some kind of inkblot test where everyone has like the lesson they expected to draw and they can all look at the inkblot and see the lesson they wanted to extract. I think a way my beliefs have changed is it feels to me that our collective response to COVID-19 has been broadly similar to our collective response to other kind of like novel problems or like when humans have to do something, it's not what they were doing before. They don't do that hot. I think there's some uncertainty over like how much do we have like a hidden reserve of ability to get our act together and like do really hard things we haven't done before? Um, that's pretty relevant to the AI case because like if things are drawn out, there will be this period where everyone is probably freaking out, uh, where there's some growing recognition of a problem, but where we need to do something different than we've done in the past. And we're wondering when civilization is on the line, like, are we going to get our act together? I remain uncertain about that, the extent to which we have like when it really comes down to it, the ability to get our act together, but it definitely looks a lot less likely than it did before. Like, I think I had, yeah, maybe I would say this response was, like, down in my, like, 25th percentile or something of how much we got our act together, surprisingly, when stuff was on the line. It involved quite a lot of, like, everyone having their lives massively disrupted and a huge amount of smart people's attention on the problem, but still, like, I would say we didn't, we didn't fare that well or we didn't, like, manage to, like, dig into some untapped reserves of ability to do stuff. It's just hard for us to do things that are different from what we've done before. That's one thing. Um, maybe a second update that's more like a side an argument I've been on that I feel like should now be settled forevermore is like sometimes you'll express concern about AI systems doing something really bad and people will mm. respond in a way that's like, why wouldn't future people just do X? Like, why would they deploy AI systems that would end up destroying the world? Or why wouldn't they just like use the following technique or adjust the objective in the following way? And I think that like in the COVID case, our response has been extremely bad compared to, like, sentences of the forum, why don't they just? Like, there's a lot of room for debate over, like, how well mm. we did collectively compared to where expectations should have been. But I think there's not that much debate of the forum, like, if you were telling a nice story in advance, there are lots of things you might have expected we would just. And so I do think that, like, one should at least be very open to the possibility that there will be significant value at stake, like, potentially our whole future, but we will not do things that are, in some sense, like, obvious responses to make the, make the problem go away. Like, I think we should all be open to the possibility of kind of a massive failure on an issue that, like, many people are aware of. Um, due to whatever combination of, like, it's hard to do new things, there are competing concerns, random basic questions become highly politicized, there's, like, institutional issues, blah, blah, blah. It just seems like it's now very easy to vividly imagine that. I think I have overall just increased my probability of, like, the doom scenario where you have a period of a couple of years of, like, AI stuff heating up a lot, there being a lot of attention, a lot of people yelling, a lot of people very scared. I do think that's just, like, an important scenario to be able to handle significantly better than we handled the pandemic, hopefully. I mean, hopefully the problem is easier than the pandemic. I think there's a reasonable chance, like, handling the alignment thing will be harder than it would have been to, like, completely eradicate COVID-19 and not have to have large numbers of deaths and lockdowns. I think if that's the case, we'd be in a rough spot. Though also, like, again, I think it was really hard for, like, the effective altruist community to do that much to help with the overall handling of the pandemic. And I do think that, like, the game is very different the more you've been preparing for that exact case. Um, and I think it was also a helpful illustration of that in various ways. So the final thing, before we kind of go into sort of like specifically like what technical problems we could solve to stop existential risk. Back in 2014, uh, this Oxford philosopher Nick Bostrom wrote an influential book called Superintelligence that I believe was like, if you, if you look at like the current sort of strand of like, I guess, intellectual influence around like AI alignment research, it was sort of the first book in that vein that had come out. And, you know, it's been seven years since 2014 when it was published. I think the book currently strikes some people as somewhat outdated. Um, I'm wondering, like, but but it does, like, try to go into, like, you know, what, what would uh, the advance of AI capabilities perhaps look like and what kind of risks could that face? So I'm wondering, like, how do you see your current views as comparing to those presented in superintelligence? And what do you think the major differences are, if any? I guess for super, when looking at superintelligence, you could split apart something that's like the actual claims Nick Bostrom is making and the kinds of arguments he's advancing versus something that's like a vibe, like that overall permeates the book. I think that first about like the vibe, I think that even at the time, I guess I've always been 
uh, very in the direction of like expecting AI to look kind of like business as usual or to progress somewhat like in a boring, continuous way. Hmm. To be unlikely to be accompanied by a decisive strategic advantage. Sorry, uh, for the person who develops it. Uh, what what is a decisive strategic advantage? This is an idea I think Nick introduced maybe in that book of hmm. like the developer of a technology being at uh like at the time they develop it having enough of an advantage over potential competitors, either economic competitors or like military competitors, that they can sort of call the shots. And if someone disagrees with the shots they called, they can just crush them. I think he has this intuition that, like, there's a reasonable chance that there will be, like, some small part of the world, like maybe a country or a firm or whatever, that develops AI that will then be in such a position, like, they can just do what they want. And you can imagine that coming from other technologies as well. People really often talk about it in the context of, like, transformative AI. And, And so even at the time, you were skeptical of this idea that, like, some AI system would get a decisive strategic advantage and, like, rule the world or something. Yeah, I think that... I was definitely skeptical of that as he was writing the book. I think we talked about it a fair amount and often came down to this, like, he'd point to the arguments and be like, look, these aren't really, like, making objectionable assumptions. And I'd be like, that's true. There's something in the vibe I don't quite resonate with. But um, I do think the arguments are not nearly as far in this direction as part of the vibe. Anyways, there's some spectrum of, like, how much, like, decisive strategic advantage, hard takeoff, like, you expect things to be versus how kind of boring looking, moving slowly you expect things to be. And I'm generally... At the other end of that spectrum, I guess, from super intelligence is not actually at the far end of the spectrum. Um, probably like Eliezer and Miri folks are at the furthest end of that spectrum. Mm. Um, and then super intelligence is some step towards like a more normal looking view. And then okay. like many more steps towards a normal looking view where like I think it will be, you know, years between when you have sort of economically impactful AI systems and the singularity. Still a long way to get from me to an actual normal view. So that's, like, a big... I think that, like, affects the vibe in a lot of places. There's, like, a lot of discussion, which is really... You have some implicit image in the back of your mind, and it affects the way you talk about it. And then I guess in the interim, I think my views have... I don't know how they've directionally changed on this question. It hasn't been, like, a huge change. I think, like, there's something where the overall, like, AI safety community has maybe moved more in a, like, things seem... Like, probably, like, there'll be giant projects that involve large amounts of investment, and probably there'll be, like, a run-up that's a little bit more gradual. Uh, I think that's, like, a little bit more in the water than it was when superintelligence was written. Mm. I think some of that comes from, like, shifting who is involved in discussions of alignment. Like, as it's become an issue more people are talking about, views on the issue have tended to become more, like, normal person's views on normal questions. I guess I like to think some of it is, like, there were sort of, like, some implicit assumptions being glossed over going into the vibe. And some of it, I guess, like, Eliezer would basically pin this on, like, people like to believe comfortable stories and the disruptive change story is uncomfortable, so everyone will naturally gravitate towards, like, a comfortable, like, continuous progress story. Which, that's not my account, but that's definitely, like, a plausible account for why sort of the vibe has changed a little bit. So that's one way in which I think, like, the vibe of superintelligence maybe feels, like, distinctively from some years ago. I think in terms of the arguments, like, the main thing is just that the book is often not, like, it's kind of making what we would now talk about as, like, very basic points or something. Mm. Like, it's not getting that much into, like, empirical evidence on a question like takeoff speeds and is more, like, raising the possibility of, like, well, it could be the case that AI is really fast at making AI better. And, like, it's good to raise that possibility. That naturally leads into, like, people really getting more into the weeds and being like, well, how likely is that? And what historical data bears on that possibility? And what are really, like, the core questions? But, yeah, I guess my sense, and I haven't read the book in a pretty long time, but my sense is that, like, the arguments and, like, sort of, claims where it's more sticking its neck out just tend to be like milder less in the weeds claims and then the overall vibe is like a little bit uh like more in this decisive strategic advantage direction yeah like i remember discussing with him like when he was writing it there's one chapter in the book on like multipolar outcomes uh which i found like to me feels weird and then i'm like that's like the great majority of possible outcomes involve like lots of actors with considerable power it's like weird to put that in one chapter yeah i think his perspective was more like should we even have that chapter should we just cut it we don't have like that much to say about multipolar outcomes per se Mm. it's like he was not reading like one chapter on multipolar outcomes as like i think in some way it like reflects the vibe the vibe of the book is like this is the thing that could happen it's like no more likely than the decided strategic advantage or perhaps even like less likely and the less words are spilled on it but i think the arguments don't really go there, and in some sense, like, the vibe is not entirely, like, a reflection of some, like, calculated argument Nick believed and just wasn't saying. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it was it was interesting. So, last year, I reread, uh, I think, a large part, maybe not all of the book. I mean, you should call me on all my false claims about superintelligence then. Yeah, no, it was... 
Well, last year was a while ago, but um, <laughs> it was. One one thing I noticed is that at the start of the book, and also whenever he gives, whenever he like had a podcast interview about the thing, he like you know often did take great pains to say like, look, amount of time I spend on a topic in the book is not the same thing as my like likelihood assessment of it. And it, yeah, it, it's definitely to some degree like weighted towards things he thinks he can talk about, which is fine. And and he he definitely like in a bunch of places is like yeah, X is possible. You know, if this happened, then that other thing would happen. And like I think it's very easy to read into that, like, likelihood assessments that he's actually just not making. I do think he had some, he definitely has some empirical beliefs that are way more on the decisive strategic advantage end of the spectrum. But I do think the vibe is more, can go even further in that direction. Yeah. All right. The next thing I'd like to talk about is, like, what technical problems could cause existential risk and, like, how you think about that space. So, yeah, I guess, first of all, yeah, what, how do you see the space of, like, like, which problems might cause technical problems? might cause AI existential risk, and, like, how do you carve that up? I think I probably have slightly different carving ups for research questions that one might work on versus, hmm. like, root cause of failures that might lead to doom. Okay. Um, maybe starting with the, like, root cause of failure. I certainly spend most of my time thinking about alignment or intent alignment. That is, I'm very concerned about a possible scenario where AI systems, right, basically as an artifact of the way they're trained, most likely... Uh, are just trying to do something that's very bad for humans. So, okay. for example, AI systems are trying to cause the camera to show happy humans. In the limit, this results, or this, like, really incentivizes behaviors like ensuring that you control the camera and you control, like, what pixels or, like, what light is going into the camera. And if humans try and stop you from doing that, then you don't really care about the welfare of the humans. Anyway, so I think the main thing I think about is that kind of scenario where somehow the training process leads to an AI system that's working at cross-purposes to humanity. So maybe I think of that as like half of the total risk in a transition to like in the sort of early days of shifting from humans doing the cognitive work to AIs doing the cognitive work. And then there's another half of difficulties where it's a little bit harder to say if they're posed by technical problems or by social. I mean, I think for both of these, it's very hard to say whether the, the doom is due to technical failure or due to social failure or due to whatever. But there are a lot of other ways in which like if you think of like human society as kind of like the repository of what humans want, the thing that will ultimately like go out into space and determine what happens with space. Hmm. There are lots of ways in which that could get messed up during a transition to AI. Right? So you could imagine there will be... AI will enable like significantly more competent like attempts to manipulate people, uh, more significantly higher quality rhetoric or argument than humans have traditionally been exposed to. So to the extent that like the process of us collectively deciding what we want is sort of calibrated to the kind of arguments humans make, then just like like most technologies, AI has some way of changing like that process or some prospect of changing that process or ending up somewhere different. Yeah, I think AI has an unusually large potential impact on that process, um, but it's not like different in kind from like the internet or phones or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think for all of those things, you might be like, well, I like, you know, I care about this thing, like the humans, we collectively care about this thing. And like, to the extent that we would care about different things if technology went differently, in some sense, like, we probably don't just want to say, like, whatever way technology goes, that's the, that's the one we really wanted. We might want to, like, look out over all the ways technology could go and say, oh, yeah, this is the, to the extent there's disagreement. Like, this mm. is actually the one we most endorse. So I think there's, like, some concerns like that. I think another related issue is, like, actually, yeah, there's, like, a lot of issues of that flavor. I think most people tend to be significantly more concerned with, the risk of everyone dying than the risk of like humanity surviving but going out into space um, and doing the wrong thing. There are exceptions. There are people on the other side who are like, man, Paul is too concerned with the risk of everyone dying and not enough concerned with the risk of doing weird stuff in space. Like Wei Dai really often argues for a lot of these risks and tries to prevent people from forgetting about them or not prioritizing them enough. Anyway, I think a lot of the things I would list other than alignment that like loom largest to me are in that second category of humanity survives but does something that in some alternative world we might have regarded as a mistake. Um, I'm happy to talk about those, but I don't know if they're actually quite what you have in mind or what most listeners care about. And I think there's another category that's like just ways that we go extinct, where in some sense, like AI is not the weapon of extinction or something, but just plays a part in the story. So like if AI contributes to the start of a war and then the war results or escalates to catastrophe, yep. or if AI is if you, sort of any catastrophic risk that faces humanity, I think we might have mentioned this briefly before, yep. like technical problems around AI can have an effect on how well humanity handles that problem. Okay. Um, so it can have an effect on how well humanity responds to like some sudden change in its circumstances and like a failure to respond well may result in like this war escalating or like responding really poorly to social unrest or climate change or whatever. Yeah. 
Okay. I, I guess I'll talk a little bit about intent alignment mostly because that's what I prepared for the most. Um, it's also what I spend almost all my time thinking about, so I love talking about intent alignment. All right, great. Well, I've got good news. Back, backing up a little bit. Sometimes when Elias Yudkowsky talks about AI, he talks about this task of like copy pasting a strawberry, where like you have a strawberry and you have some you know system that has really good scanners and like maybe it can do nanotechnology stuff or whatever and like the goal is like you have a strawberry you want to like look at how all of its cells are arranged and you want to copy paste it so there's a second strawberry right next to it that is cellularly identical to the first strawberry or it's, I, I might be getting some details of this wrong but that's roughly it and he's there's the contention that like we maybe don't know how to safely do the copy paste to strawberry task and i'm wondering when you say intent alignment do you mean like some sort of alignment with like my deep human psyche and like you know all the the things that i really value in the world or do you intend that to also include things like i would today i would like this strawberry copy pasted can i get a machine that's you know does that without having all sorts of like crazy weird side effects or something so definitely the definitions aren't crisp but i try and think in terms of like an ai system which is trying to do what paul wants do what paul wants is in quotes um, so the AI system may not understand like all the intricacies of what Paul desires and like how Paul would want to reconcile conflicting intuitions. It's just trying to make some reasonable like also what Paul wants. There's like a, a broad range of interpretations. Unclear what I'm even referring to with that. But like I am mostly interested in AI that's like broadly trying to understand what Paul wants and help Paul do that, um, rather than an AI which like understands really deeply. Or like I'm not too concerned about whether my AI understands really deeply what I want. Because I mostly want an AI that's not sort of actively killing all humans or attempting to ensure humans are shoved over in the corner somewhere with no ability to influence the universe. I'm like really concerned about it, cases where AI is working at cross purposes to humans in ways that are like very flagrant. And so I think like it's fair to say that like taking some really mundane task, like put your strawberry on a plate or whatever, is a fine yeah, is a fine example task. And I think probably I'd be broadly on the same page as Eliezer. There's definitely some ways we would talk about this differently. I think we both agree that like having a really powerful AI, which can sort of overkill the problem and do it in any number of ways, and getting it to just be like, yeah, if the person wants like a strawberry, could you give them a strawberry? And getting it to just like actually give them a strawberry captures like the, in some sense, core of the problem. I would say probably the biggest difference between us is like, in contrast with Eliezer, I am like really focused on saying I want my AI to do things as effectively as any other AI. I mm. care a lot about this idea of being sort of economically competitive or just broadly competitive with other AI systems. Um, I think for Eliezer, that's a much less central concept. So the strawberry example is sort of a weird one to think about from that perspective because you're just like all the AIs are fine at putting a strawberry on a plate. Maybe not for this copy of strawberry cell by cell. Maybe that's a really hard thing to do. But yeah, I think we're broadly on the same page. Okay, so you were saying that you carve up, like, per perhaps research projects that one could do and sort of root causes of failure slightly differently. And I think was 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 intent alignment a root cause of failure or a research problem? Yeah, I think it's a root cause of failure. Okay, so, um, yeah, how would you carve up the research problems? I spend most of my time just thinking about divisions within intent alignment. That okay. is, like, what are the various problems that help with intent alignment? I'd be happy to just focus on that. I can also try and comment on like problems that seem helpful for other dimensions of potential doom i guess like a salient for me distinction is like there's lots of ways your ai could be better or, like more competent that would also help reduce doom like for example you could imagine working on ai systems that cooperate effectively with other ai systems hmm. or ai systems that are like able to diffuse certain kinds of conflict that could otherwise escalate dangerously or ai systems that understand a lot about human psychology etc so i would sort of like you could slice up those kind of technical problems like technical problems that improve the capability of ai in particular ways that reduce the risk of some of these, like, dooms involving AI. That's, like, sort of what I mean by, like, I'd slice up the research things you could do differently from the actual dooms. But yeah, I spend most of my time thinking about within intent alignment, uh, what are the things you could work on. And there, the sense in which I slice up research problems differently from sources of doom is that I mostly think about, like, a particular approach to making AI intent aligned, and then, like, what are the building blocks of that approach? And, like, there will be different approaches. There are different sets of building blocks. And some of them occur over and over again. Like, sort of different versions of interpretability appear as a building block and like, many possible approaches. Mm. Um, but I think the carving up, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like a tree or an ore of ands or something like that. And, like, there are different top-level ores, like, at several different paths to being okay. And then for each of them, you'd say, well, this one, like, you have to do the following five things or whatever. Um, and so 
there's kind of two levels of carving up. One is between different approaches to achieving intent alignment, and then within each approach, like different things that have to go right in order for that approach to help. Okay. So one question that I have about intent alignment is um, it seems like it's sort of relating to this, like, uh, what I might call like a Humean decomposition, where like this philosopher David Hume, he said something uh, approximately like, look, the thing about uh, the way people work is that they have beliefs and they have desires and like beliefs can't motivate you, only desires can. And the way they produce action is that you like try to do actions which according to your beliefs fulfill your desires. And it seems like by talking about intent alignment, it seems like you're sort of imagining something similar for AI systems. But it's not obviously true that that's how AI systems work. Like if you look at like some, you know, in reinforcement learning, you know, one way of training systems is to just like basically search over neural networks to get one that produces really good behavior. And you look at it and it's just like, you know, a bunch of numbers. Um, it's it's not obvious that it has this kind of belief desire uh, decomposition. So I'm wondering like, yeah, did, sh should I take it to mean that you think that that decomposition will exist? Or do you mean beliefs and desires in like uh, some kind of behavioral way? or intent in some sort of behavioral way, or, yeah, how should I understand that? Yeah, it's definitely a shorthand that is probably not going to apply super cleanly to systems that we build. Um, so I can say a little bit about both the kinds of cases you mentioned and, like, how to, what I mean more generally, and also a little bit about why I think this kind of shorthand is, like, kind of reasonable. I think the most basic reason to be interested in, like, systems that aren't trying to do something bad and maybe that's a first subtlety. There's like some distinction between a system that's trying to do the right thing. That's like a goal we want to achieve. There's like a more minimal goal that's like a system that's not trying to do something bad. Mm. Um, so you might think that like some systems are trying or some systems can be said to have intentions or whatever. But like actually would be fine with a system that like has no intentions and whatever, whatever that means. I think that's pretty reasonable and I'd certainly be happy with that. Um, like most of my research is actually just focused on building systems that aren't trying to do the wrong thing. Anyway, that caveat aside, I think the basic reason we're interested in like something like intention is we look at some failures we're concerned about. I think like first, we believe it is possible to build systems that are trying to do the wrong thing. Like okay. we think that it's the thing we like are aware of algorithms like search over actions and for each one predict its consequences and then rank them according to some function of the consequences and pick your favorite. Yep. We're aware of algorithms like that that can be said to have intention. And we see how some algorithm like that, if, say, produced by stochastic gradient descent, or if applied to a model produced by stochastic gradient descent, could lead to some kinds of really bad policies, like could lead to systems that actually, like, systematically dis and permanently disempower the humans. So we, like, see how there are algorithms that have something like intention that could lead to really bad outcomes. And conversely, when we look at, like, how those bad outcomes could happen, like, if you're, like, you imagine the robot army, like, killing everyone... It's very much not like the robot army just randomly killed everyone. Like, there sort of has mm. to be some force keeping the process on track towards the killing everyone endpoint um, in order to get this, like, really highly specific sequence of actions. And kind of the thing we want to point out is whatever that is. So, like, maybe... Sure. I guess I most often think about, like, optimization as a sort of subjective property. That is, like, I will say that an object is optimized for some end. Like, let's say I'm wondering, like, there's a bit that was output by this computer. And I'm wondering, is the bit optimized to achieve, like, human extinction? The way I'd operationalize that would be by saying, like, well, I don't know whether the bit being zero or one is more likely to lead to human extinction. But I would say the bit is optimized just when, like, if you told me the bit was one, I would believe it's more likely that the bit being one leads to human extinction. Like, there's this correlation between my uncertainty about the consequences of different bits that could be output and my uncertainty about which bit will be output. So in this case, uh, whether it's, like, optimized could potentially depend on your background knowledge, right? That's right. Yeah, different people could disagree about, like, one person could think something is optimizing for A, and the other person could think someone is optimizing for not A. Like, mm. that is possible in principle. And, and and not only could they think that, they could both be right, in a sense. That's right. There's, like, no fact of the matter beyond what the person thinks. And, like, so from that perspective, optimization is mostly something we talk, we're talking about, like, from our perspective as algorithm designers. Mm. So, like, when we're designing the algorithm, like, we are in this epistemic state, and our goal, we are, like, the thing we'd like to do is from our epistemic state, there shouldn't be this optimization for doom. Like okay. we shouldn't end up with these correlations where the algorithm we write is more likely to produce actions that lead to doom. And that's something where like kind of we are retreating. Most of the time we're designing an algorithm, we're like retreating to some set of things we know and like kind of some kind of reasoning we're doing. And we're, like within that universe, we want to eliminate this correlation or this possible bad correlation. Okay. There are tons of, yeah, this exposes tons of rough edges, which I'm certainly happy to talk about lots of. Yeah, I mean, one, I mean, one way you could, uh, I guess, 
it depends a bit on, I guess, whether you're talking about correlation or mutual information or something. But on, on some of these definitions, like one way you can reduce any dependence is if like, you know, with certainty what the system is going to do. Right. So like, or, or perhaps even if like, you know, like, I don't know exactly like what's going to happen, but I know it will be some sort of hell world. And like, then there's no correlation. So it's not optimizing for doom. It sounds like. Yeah. I mean, I think the way that I'm thinking about that is like, I have my m- robot, and my robot's, like, taking some torques, so I have my thing connected to the internet, and it's, like, sending some packets. Hmm. And in some sense, like, right, we can be in the situation where it's optimizing for Doom, and certainly Doom is achieved, and I'm merely uncertain about what path leads to Doom. I'm like, okay. well, I don't know what packets it's going to send, and I don't know what packets lead to Doom. For if I knew, if I knew as algorithm designer what packets lead to Doom, I'd just be like, oh, this is easy one. If the packet okay. is going to send lead to Doom, like, no go. Yeah. But, like, I don't know what packets lead to Doom. And I don't know what packets it's going to output, but I'm pretty sure the ones it's going to output like have a higher, or maybe I could be sure they lead to Doom, or I could just be like, those are more likely to be Doomy ones. And like the situation I'm really terrified of as a human is the one where like there's this algorithm which has the two following properties. One is that like its outputs are especially likely to be economically valuable to me okay. for reasons I don't understand, and two, its outputs are especially likely to be Doomy for reasons I don't understand. And if I'm a human in that situation, I have these outputs from my algorithm, and I'm like, well, darn. I could use them or not use them. If I use them, mm. I'm getting some doom. And if I don't use them, I'm getting some, like, leaving some value on the table, which, like, my competitors could take. In the sense of value where, like... Like, I could run a better be company. Yeah, yeah. It's not you great run value. A better, yeah. They could run a better company that would have each year some probability of doom. And then, like, the people who want to make that trade-off will be the ones who end up with the actually steering the course of humanity, which they then steer to doom. Okay, so so in that case, it sort of sounds like Maybe the, like, human decomposition there is, like, there's this, like, correlation between, you know, how good the world is or whatever and, like, what the system does and the direction of the correlation or something is supposed, is maybe going to be, like, the intent or the motivations of the system and maybe the strength of the correlation or, like, you know, how how tightly you can infer that's something more like capabilities or something. Does that seem right? Yeah, I guess I would say that on this human, human, whatever perspective, like there's kind of two steps, both of which are to me about optimization. One is okay. like we say the system has accurate beliefs, by which we're talking about like a certain core. To me, this is also a subjective condition. Okay. Like I say the system like believes X or like correctly believes X to the extent there's like this correlation between like the actual truth of affairs and like what some representation it has or whatever. Okay. So it's like one step like that. And then there's a second step where there's a correlation between which action it selects and its beliefs about the consequences of the action. In some sense, I do think I, like, want to be a little bit more general than, like, the framework you might use for thinking about humans. So, right, like, in the context of an AI system, there's traditionally, like, a lot of places where optimization is being applied. So, like, you're doing stochastic gradient descent, which is itself significant optimization over the weights of your neural network. But then those optimized weights will tend to produce, like, like, those will tend to themselves do optimization because some weights do, and the weights that do, you have optimized towards them. And then, like, also, you're often combining that with explicit search. Like, after you've trained your model, often you're going to use it as part of some search process. Okay. So there are, like, a lot of places optimization is coming into this process. And so I'm not normally, like, literally thinking about, like, the AI that has, like, some beliefs and some desires that decouple. But I am trying to be sort of, like, doing this accounting or being like, well, what is a way in which this thing could end up optimizing for Doom? How can we, like, get some handle on that and try and... I guess I'm simultaneously thinking, how could it actually be doing something productive in the world? And how can it be optimizing for Doom? And then trying to think about, like, is there a way to, like, decouple those or, like, get the one without the other? Um, but that could be happening. Like, if I imagine an AI, I don't really imagine it having, like, coherent set of beliefs, right? I imagine it being this neural network that has, like, there are tons of parts of the neural network that could be understood as beliefs about something. And tons of parts of the neural network that could be understood as optimizing. So it'd be, like, this very fragmented, crazy mind. Um, probably human minds are also like this. But they don't really have coherent beliefs and coherent um, desires. But it's kind of like we want to stamp out. We're going to stamp out all of the desires that are not, like helping humans get what they want, or at least all of the desires that involve killing all the humans at a minimum. So, okay, now that I sort of understand um, intense alignment, uh, sometimes people divide this up into, like, outer and inner versions of intense alignment. Um, Sometimes people talk about, like, various types of robustness that um, properties could have, or that systems could have. I'm wondering, like, do you have a favorite of these, like, further decompositions, or do you not think about it that way as much? I mentioned before this like or of ands where there's like lots of different paths you could go down and then within each path there'll be lots of breakdowns of what technical problems need to be resolved. Hmm. I guess I think of outer and inner alignment as like for several of the leaves in this or of ands or several of the branches in this or of ands, several of the possible approaches. 
you can talk about like, oh, these things are needed to achieve outer alignment and these things are needed to achieve inner alignment and with their powers combined will achieve a good outcome. Often you can't talk about such a decomposition. Like in general, I don't think you can like look at a system and be like, oh yeah, that part's outer alignment and that part's inner alignment. It's like the times when you can talk about it most or like the way I use that language most often is for a particular kind of alignment strategy where you, it's like a two-step plan. Step Mm. one is like develop an objective that captures what humans want well enough to be getting on with. And there's like some... It's going to be something more specific, but some you have an objective that captures what humans want in some sense. Okay. Ideally, it would exactly capture what humans want. So, like, you look at the behavior of a system, and you're just exactly evaluating, like, how good for humans is it to deploy a system with that behavior or something. So you have that as step one, and then that step would be outer alignment. And then step two is, like, given that we have an objective that captures what humans want, let's build a system that's, like, internalized that objective in some sense, or, like, is not doing any optimization contrary to, like, any other optimization beyond pursuit of that objective. Um, and so in particular, the objective is an objective that you might want the system to adopt rather than a, an objective over systems. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're sort of equivocating in this way that like reveals problematicness or something. But like the first mm. objective is like, it's like an objective. It is a ranking over systems or it's like some reward it, like okay. tells us how good is a behavior. And then we're hoping that the system then like adopts that same thing or some reflection of that thing. Okay. That was like a ranking over policies. And then we just get the like obvious analog of that or whatever over actions. And and so you think of these as like different problems or, or, or like different like sub problems to a uh, sort of whole thing of intent alignment rather than like you know objectively like oh this system has an outer alignment problem but the inner alignment's great or something yeah that's right i think this makes sense on some approaches and not on other approaches i am most often thinking of it as there's some set of problems that kind of seem necessary for outer alignment I don't really believe that it's, like, the problems are going to split into, like, these are the outer alignment problems and these are the inner alignment problems. I think of it more as, like, the outer alignment problems or the things that are sort of obviously necessary for outer alignment are more likely to be, like, useful stepping stones or, like, warm-up problem or something. Okay. Like, I suspect in the end it's not like we have our piece that does outer alignment and our piece that does inner alignment and we put them together. Um, I think it's more like there were a lot of problems we had to solve. In the end, when you look at the set of problems, it's kind of, like, unclear how you would attribute responsibility or what. Or, like, there's no part that's solving outer versus inner alignment. But it was still, like, useful. There were, like, a set of sub-problems that were pretty useful to have solved. It's kind of just, like, the outer alignment thing here is acting as, like, an easy special case to start with or something like that. It's not technically a special case. There's actually something worth saying there, probably, which is, like, it's easier to work on a special case than to work on some vaguely defined, like, here's kind of a thing that would be nice. Sure, um, sure. So I do most often, like, when I'm thinking about my research, when I want to, like, focus on sub-problems that are, like, to specialize on, like, the outer alignment part, which I'm doing more in this warm-up problem perspective, I think of it in terms of high-stakes versus low-stakes decisions. So in particular, if you've solved what we're describing as outer alignment, if you have a reward function that captures what humans care about well enough, and if the individual decisions made by your system are sufficiently low-stakes, then it seems like you can get a good outcome just by doing sort of online learning. That is, you constantly retrain your system as it acts. And, like, it can do bad things for a while as it moves out of distribution, but eventually you'll fold that data back into the training process. Yeah. And so if you had a good reward function and the stakes are low, then you can kind of get a good outcome. So that's when I say that I, like, think about outer alignment as a sub-problem. I mostly mean, like, I kind of ignore the problem of high-stakes decisions or, like, fast-acting catastrophes and just focus on the difficulties that arise even when uh, every individual decision is very low stakes. Sure. So that actually brings up another style of decomposition that uh, some people use or some people prefer, which is like sort of a distributional question. So so there's one way of thinking about it where like outer alignment is like, you know, pick a good objective and inner alignment is like hope that the system assumes that objective. Another distinction people sometimes make is like, okay, firstly, like we'll have some training, we'll, we'll have some like set of situations that we're going to develop our AI to behave well in. And like step one is like making sure our AI does the right thing in that test distribution, uh, which is, I guess, supposed to be like kind of similar to outer alignment. Like you train a thing that's sort of supposed to roughly do what you want. Then there's this question of like, does it generalize, you know, you know, in a different distribution, firstly, does it behave competently? And then does it continue pursuing, does it continue to reliably achieve the stuff that you wanted? And that's supposed to be more like inner alignment because, like, if the system had really internalized the objective, then it would, you know, supposedly continue pursuing it in later places. And it's kind of there are some d- distinctions between that and especially the frame where like alignment is supposed to be about like, are you representing this like objective in your head or something? And I'm wondering how how do you think about those the the differences between those frames or whether you view them as like basically the same thing? 
I think I don't view them as the same thing. I think I think of those two splits and then a third split I alluded to briefly of like sort of high stakes failures versus or like avoiding very fast catastrophes versus average case performance. Okay. I think I think of those three splits as just like all roughly agreeing. There will be some approaches where one of those splits is like a literal split of the problems you have to solve where like literally factors into doing one of those and then doing the other. I think that the actual, the exact thing you stated is a thing people often talk about, but I don't think it really works even as kind of a conceptual split quite, where the main problem is just like, if you train a system to do well in some distribution, there's kind of two big limitations you get. One is like two related big limitations you get. One is that it doesn't work off distribution. And the other is just that like, you only have like an average case property over that distribution. Hmm. So it seems like in the real world, it is actually possible. It looks like it's almost certainly going to be possible for deployed AI systems to fail quickly enough that the actual harm done by individual bad decisions is much too large to bound with an average case guarantee. So you can imagine like the system, which appears to work well on distribution, but actually with like one in every quadrillion decisions, it just decides like now it's time to start killing all the humans. And that system is quite bad. And I think that like in practice, like probably it's better to lump that problem in with distributional shift, which kind of makes sense. And maybe people even mean to include that. It's a little bit unclear exactly what they have in mind. But just, like, distributional shift is kind of just changing the probabilities of outcomes. And, like, the concern is really just, like, things that were improbable under your original distribution. And you could have a problem either because you're in a new distribution, where those things go from being very rare to being common. Yep. Or you could have a problem just because they were, like, relatively rare, so you just didn't encounter any during training. But they'll still, if you keep sampling even on distribution, eventually one of those will get you yep. and cause trouble. Or like, maybe there were literally zero in the yeah the data set you drew, but not in the distribution the probability it. the yeah. quote unquote probability distribution that you drew your data set from yeah so i guess maybe that is fair i like really naturally reach for like the underlying probability distribution but i think like out mm. of distribution in some sense like is most likely to be like our actual split of the problem if we mean the empirical distribution over like the actual episodes at hand um anyway i think of all three of those decompositions then that was like a random caveat in the auto distribution one sure i think of all of those like kind of related breakdowns my guess is that like the right way of going doesn't actually respect any of those breakdowns and it like doesn't have a set of techniques that solve one versus the other. But I think it is very often helpful. Like it's just generally when doing research helpful to specialize on a sub problem. And I think often like one branch or the other of one of those splits is a helpful way to think about like the specialization you want to do during a current a particular research project. The splits I most often use are this like low stakes one where you can train online and individual decisions are not catastrophic. And then the other arm of that split is this like Suppose you have the ability to detect a catastrophe if one occurs, or you sort of trust your ability to assess the utility of actions, and now you want to build a system which doesn't do anything catastrophic, even when deployed in the real world on a potentially different distribution, encountering potentially rare failures. That's the split I most often use. But okay. I think none of these are likely to be respected by the actual like list of techniques that together address the problem, but often one half or the other is like a useful way to help zoom in on what assumptions you want to make during a particular research project. And, and why do you prefer that split? I think most of all, because it's fairly clear what the problem statement is. So the problem statement there is just a feature of the thing outside of your algorithm. Like you're writing some algorithm and then your mm. problem statement is like, here is a fact about the domain in which you're going to apply the algorithm. The fact is that like, it's impossible to mess things up super fast. Okay. And it's nice to have a problem statement, which is entirely external to the algorithm. Mm. Like if you want to just say like, here's the assumption we're making. Now we want to solve that problem. It's great to have an assumption on the environment be your assumption. There's some risk if you say like, oh, our assumption is going to be that the agent's going to like internalize whatever objective we use to train it. Um, the definition of that assumption is like stated in terms of it's like, it's kind of like helping yourself to some sort of magical ingredient. Mm. And like, if you optimize for solving that problem, you're going to like push into a part of the space where that magical ingredient was doing like a really large part of the work, um, which I think is like a much more dangerous dynamic dynamic than like, like if, it, if the assumption is just on the environment in some sense you're limited in how much of that you can do you have to solve the remaining part of the problem you didn't assume away and i'm really scared of sub problems which just assume that some part of the algorithm will work well because i think you often just end up like pushing an inordinate amount of the difficulty into that step okay another question that i want to ask about these sorts of decompositions of problems is I think most of the world i think most of the i guess the intellectual tradition that's sort of spawned off of like Nick Bostrom and Elias Rydkowski uses like some an approach kind of like this, may, maybe with an emphasis on like learning things that like people want to do. That's like particularly prominent at the research group I work at. There's also I think some subset of people, lar largely I think concentrated at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, that are interested in a, sort of a more like like they have this sense that like oh we just like don't understand the basics of AI well enough and we need to like really think about decision theory and we really need to think about what it means to be an agent and like then you know once we understand this kind of stuff better then like maybe it'll be easier to solve those problems is something they might say i'm wondering like yeah what, what do you think about this f yeah th this approach to research where you're just like okay let's like figure out these basic problems and like 
try and get a good formalism that we can work from from there on. I think, yeah, this is mostly a methodological question, probably, rather than a question about the situation with respect to AI, although it's not totally clear. There may be like differences in belief about AI that are doing the real work. But methodologically, I'm very drawn. Like, suppose you want to understand better, like, what is optimization? Or you have some like very high level question like that. Yeah. Like, what is like bounded rationality? I am very drawn to an approach where you say like, okay, we think that's going to be important down the line. We think at some point as we're trying to solve alignment, we're going to like really be hurting for want of an understanding of like bounded rationality. I really want to just be like, let's just go until we get to that point until we like really see like what problem we wanted to solve. And like where it was that we were like reaching for this notion of bounded rationality we didn't have. Mm. And then at that point, we will have some like more precise specification of like what we actually want out of this theory of bounded rationality. Okay. And like, I think that is the moment to be trying to dig into those concepts more. I think it's scary to try and go the other way. I think it's not totally crazy at all. And there are like reasons that you might prefer it. I think the basic reason it's scary is that there's probably not a complete theory of everything for many of these questions. Like there's a bunch of questions you could ask and a bunch of answers you could get that would improve your understanding. But we don't really have a statement of like what it is we actually seek. And like, it's just mm-hmm. a lot harder to do research when you're like, I want to understand. In some domains, this is the right way to go. And like, that's part of why it might come down to facts about AI, whether it's like the appropriate methodology in this domain. But like, I think it's tough to be like, I don't really know what I want to know about this thing. I'm just kind of interested in what's up with optimization and then researching optimization relative to being like, oh, here is a fairly concrete question that I would like to be able, a really concrete task I'd like to be able to address. And um, which I think like is going to come down to my understanding of optimization. I think that's just like an easier way to better understand what's up with optimization. Yeah. So at these moments where you realize you need a better theory or whatever. Yeah. Are you imagining them looking like, oh, I, here's this technical problem that I want to solve and I don't know how to, and it reminds me of optimization or, or what does the moment look like when you're like, ah, now's the time. I think the way the whole process most often looks is you have some problem. Like you're like here, I guess the way my research is organized is very much like here is the kind of thing our AI could learn for which it's not clear how our aligned AI learns something that's like equally useful. And I'm like thinking about one of these cases and digging into it. And I'm like, here's what I want. Here's I think this problem is solvable. Here's what I think the aligned AI should be doing. Okay. And I'm like thinking about that. And I'm like, oh, I don't know how to actually write down the algorithm that would lead to the aligned AI doing this thing. And I'm like walking down this path and I'm like, here's, here's a piece of what it should be doing. And here's a piece of how the algorithm should look. And then at some point you step back and you're like, oh, wow, it really looks like what I'm trying to do here is like algorithmically test for one thing being optimized for another or whatever. I mean, mm. that's a particularly doomy sounding example. But like, maybe I have some question like that, or I'm like wondering, like, what is it that leads to like the conditional independence as a human reports in this domain? Like, I really need to understand yeah. that better. And like, I think it's most often for me, not then like, okay, now let's go understand that question now that it's come up. It's most often like, let us like flag and try and like import everything that we know about like that area. Like I'm now asking a question that people that feels similar to questions people have asked before. So I want to make sure I understand what everyone has said about that area. This is a good time to like read up on everything that looks like it's likely to be relevant. The reading up is cheap to do in advance. So you should be trigger happy with that one. But then like, there's no actual pivot into like thinking about the nature of optimization. It's just like continuing to work on this problem and like expecting like that's kind of how... That may end up, like, some of those lemmas may end up feeling like statements about optimization, but there was no step where you're like, now it's time to think about optimization. Just, like, let us keep trying to design this algorithm and then see, like, what concepts fall out of that. And you mentioned that there were some domains where, like, actually thinking about the fundamentals early on was the right thing to do. Which domains are you thinking of and what do you see as the big differences between those and kind of AI alignment? Yeah, so I don't know that much about the intellectual history of almost any fields. The field I'm most familiar with by far is computer science. I think in computer science especially like, so my training is in theoretical computer science, and then I spend a bunch of time working in machine learning and deep learning. Mm. Um, I think the like problem first perspective is like, just generally seems pretty good. And I think to the extent that like, let's understand X has been important. It's often at the like problem selection stage rather than like, now we're going to research X in an open-ended way. It's like, oh, problem X seems important or like X seems interesting. And this problem seems to shed some light on X. So now that's like a reason to work on this problem. Like that's a reason to you know, try and predict this kind of sequence with ML or whatever. It's a reason to answer, to try and write an algorithm to answer this kind of question about graphs. So I think in those domains, it's not often that often the case that you just want to like start off and like have some high big picture question and then think about it abstractly. My guess would be that in domains where like more of the game is like walking up to nature and like looking at things and seeing what you see, it's like a little bit different. It's not as driven as much by like you're coming up with an algorithm and like running into constraints and designing an algorithm. I don't really know that much about the history of science though. So I'm just guessing that that might be a good domain or a good approach sometimes. All right. So we've talked a little bit about the way you might decompose inner alignment into problems or, you know, the space of like dealing with existential risk into problems, one of which is inner alignment. I'd like to talk now a little bit about 
I, I guess on a high level about your work on the solutions to these problems and you know other work that people have put out there. So first thing I want to ask is, yeah, as, as I mentioned, I'm in a research group and a lot of what we do is think about you know, how a machine learning system could learn some kind of objective, you know, from human data. So perhaps it's like the human wants that there's some human who like has some desires and they act a certain way because of those desires. And we use that to do some kind of inference. So, that, you know, this might look like inverse reinforcement learning. Um, a simple version of it might look like imitation learning. And I'm wondering what you think of these approaches for things that look more like outer alignment, more like trying to specify what a good objective is. So broadly, I think there are two kinds of goals you could be trying to serve with work like that. Or like for me, there's this really important distinction as we try and like incorporate knowledge that a human lacks, like a human demonstrator or a human operator lacks. So like the game changes as you move from like the regime where you could have applied imitation learning in principle because the operator could demonstrate how to do the task hmm. to the domain where the operator doesn't understand how to do the task and they definitely aren't using imitation learning. And so from my perspective, like one thing you could be trying to do with techniques like this is work well, like in that imitation learning regime, like in the regime where you could have imitated the operator, can you find something that works even better than imitating the operator? And I am pretty interested in that. And I think that imitating the operator is not actually that good a strategy, even if the operator is able to do the task in general. So I have worked some on reinforcement learning from human feedback in this regime. So imagine there's a task a human understands what makes performance good or bad just have the human evaluate individual trajectories, learn to predict those human evaluations, and then optimize that with RL. Hmm. I think the reason I'm interested in that technique in particular is I think of it as like sort of the most basic thing you can do or that like most makes clear exactly what the underlying assumption is that is needed for the mechanism to work. Namely, you need the operator to be able to identify which of two possible executions of a behavior is better. Anyway, there's then this further thing and, like, I don't think that that approach is the best approach. Like, I think you can do better than asking the human operator which of these two is better. I think it's pretty plausible that basically past there you're just talking about data efficiency, like how much human time do you need and so on, um, and how easy is it for the human rather than, like, a fundamental conceptual change. But I'm not that confident of that. There's a second thing you could want to do where you're like, now let's move into the regime where you can't ask the human which of these two things is better because, in fact, one of the things the human wants to learn about is, like, which of these two behaviors is better. If the human doesn't know, they're hoping AI will help them understand Actually, what's the situation in which, like, we might want that to happen? Might want like, to move beyond the human knowing? Yeah. So so suppose we want to get to this world where we're not worried about AI systems trying to kill everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we can, like, use our AI systems to, like, you know, help us with that problem, maybe. Like, can, can we somehow get to some kind of world where we're not going to build really smart AI systems that want to, like, destroy all value in the universe uh, without solving these kinds of problems where we can't even have where it's difficult for us to evaluate which solutions are right. Yeah, I think it's very unclear. I think eventually it's clear that AI needs to be doing these tasks that are very hard for humans to evaluate which answer is right. But it's very mm. unclear like how far off that is. That is, you might first live in a world where AI has had a crazy transformative impact before AI systems are regularly doing things that are like, also there's different degrees of beyond humans' ability to understand what the AI is doing. So I think that's a big open question. But in terms of the kinds of domains where you would want to do this, Part of the reason, so there's generally this trade-off between over what horizon you evaluate behavior or like kind of how much do you rely on hindsight mm. um, and how much do you rely on foresight or the human understanding which behavior will be good. Yep. So the more you want to rely on foresight, the more plausible it is that the human doesn't understand well enough to do the operation. So mm. for example, if I imagine I'm just like, my AI is sending an email for me. One regime is the regime where like, it's basically going to send the email that I like most. Like I'm going to be evaluating either actually, or like it's going to be predicting what I would say how good is this email? And it's going to be sending the email for which Paul would be like, that was truly the greatest email. The second regime where like, I send the email and then my friend replies and I look at the whole email thread that results and I'm like, wow, that email seemed like it got my thread friend to like me. I guess that was a better email. And then there's like an even more extreme one where you're like, then I look back on my relationship with my friend in three years and I'm like, given all the decisions this AI made for me over three years, like how much did they contribute to like building a really lasting friendship or whatever? And it's just like, I think if you're going to the really short horizon where I'm just evaluating an email, it's very easy to get to the regime where I think AI can be a lot better than humans at that question. Um, just like it's very easy for there to be empirical facts about like what kind of email gets a response or like mm. what kind of email will be easily understood by the person I'm talking to. Where an AI that has like sent 100 billion emails will just like potentially have a big advantage over me as a human. And then as you push out to longer horizons, it gets easier for me to evaluate. Like it's easier for a human to be like, okay, that person says they understood. 
I can evaluate the email in light of like the person's response as well as an AI could. But as you move out to those longer horizons, then you start to get scared about like whether that evaluation, like that evaluation becomes scarier to do. There starts to be more room for manipulation of the metrics that I use. So I, sorry, I'm saying all that to say there's this general, when we ask like RAI systems needing to do things that humans couldn't evaluate, like which of two behaviors is better. Yep. It depends a lot how long we make the behaviors and how much hindsight we give the human evaluators. Okay. And in general, that's like part of the tension or part of the game. We can make the thing clear by just talking about like really long horizon behaviors. So if I'm like, we're going to write an infrastructure bill and I'm like, AI, can you write an infrastructure bill for me? Hmm. It's kind of like, uh, it's very, very hard for me to understand which of two bills is better. And there is the thing where like, again, in the long game, you yep. do want AI systems helping us as a society make that kind of decision much better than we would if it was just up to like humans who look at the bill or like yep. even a thousand humans looking at the bill. Again, it's not clear how late, how early you need to do that. I am particularly interested in that kind of, I'm interested in like, all of the things humans do to like keep society on track, mm. like all of the things we do to manage risks from emerging technologies, all the things we do to cooperate with each other, et cetera. And I think a lot of those do involve like more are more interested in AI because it may help us make those decisions better rather than make them faster. And I think in cases where you sort of want something that's more like wisdom, it's more likely that the value added, if AI is to add value, it will be in ways that humans couldn't easily evaluate. Yeah. So, so we were saying like, um, we we're talking about like imitation learning or you know, inverse reinforcement learning. So looking at somebody do a bunch of stuff and then trying to infer what they were trying to do. Um, we we're talking about those as uh, solutions to outer alignment. And you were saying, yeah, it works well for things where you can uh, evaluate what's going to happen, but for things that can't, and I think I cut you off around there. Yeah, I think that's an interesting, I think you could pursue this research, either trying to improve the imitation learning setting, be like, look, imitation learning actually wasn't the best thing to do, even when we were able to demonstrate. I think that's like one interesting thing to do, which is the context where I've most often thought about this kind of thing. A second context is where you want you want to move into this regime where a human can't say which thing is better or worse. Again, okay. imagine like you've written some bill and we're like, how are we going to build an AI system that like writes good legislation for us? In some sense, like actually the meat of the problem was not writing of the legislation. It was telling us which legislation was like helping predict which legislation is actually good. We can sort of divide the problem into those two pieces. One is like an optimization problem and one is a like prediction problem. And for the prediction component, that's where really like it's unclear how you go beyond human ability. It's very easy to go beyond human ability on the optimization problem because you just dump more compute into optimizing. I think you can still try and apply things like inverse reinforcement learning, though. Like, you can be like, humans wrote a bunch of bills. Those bills were, like, imperfect attempts to optimize something about the world. Yep. You can try and back out from, like, looking at all the, not only those bills, but all the stories people write, all the words they say, blah, blah, blah. We can try and back out, like, what it is they really wanted and then, like, give them a prediction, like, how well will this bill achieve what you really wanted? And I think, like, that is particularly interesting. Like, in some sense... That is, from a long-term safety perspective, to me, more interesting than the case where a human operator could have understood the consequences of the AI's proposals. Mm. But I am also very scared of, like, the... Like, I don't think we currently have really credible proposals for inverse reinforcement learning working well in that regime. What's the difficulty of that? So I think the hardest part is I look at some human behaviors, and the thing I need to do is disentangle, like, which aspects of human behavior are limitations of the human, which are like things the human wishes about themselves they could change, yeah. um, and which are reflections of what they value. And in some sense, like, right, in the imitation learning regime, we just get to say, whatever, we don't care. We're getting the whole thing. Yeah. If the humans make bad predictions, we get bad predictions. In the inverse reinforcement learning case, we need to look at a human who's saying like, yeah, we need to look at a human who's saying these things about what they want over the long term or what they think will happen over the long term. We need to decide which of them are errors. And that work gets done, like there's no data that really pulls that apart cleanly. So it comes down to either facts about the prior or like modeling assumptions. And so then the work comes down to how much we trust those modeling assumptions in what domains. And I think my basic current take is like the game seems pretty rough or like we don't have a great menu of them available right now. I would summarize the best thing we can do right now as like basically in this prediction setting amounting to train AI systems to make predictions about all of the like things you can easily measure, yeah. train AI systems to make judgments in light of AI systems predictions about what they could easily measure, or maybe judgments in hindsight, and then um, predict those judgments in hindsight, or judgments with the like other, right? maybe the prototypical example of this is train an AI system to like predict a video of the future, then have mm. humans look at the video of the future and decide which outcome they like most. I think the most basic, the reason to be scared of like the most developed form of this, or the reason I'm scared of the most developed form of this, is mm. like, we are in the situation now where AI really wants to push on this like video of the future that's going to get shown to the human. And distinguishing between like the video of the future that gets shown to human and like what's actually happening in the world seems very hard. 
or I guess that's sort of in some sense the part of the problem I most often think about. Okay. Um, so either looking forward to a future where it's very hard for human to make heads or tails of what's happening, or a future where human believes they can make heads or tails, heads and tails of what's happening, but um, they're mistaken about that. For example, again, we might think a thing we want our AIs to help us do is like keep the world sane and make everything make sense in the world. So like we would prefer if our AI shows us several videos of the future and nine of them are incomprehensible and one of them makes perfect sense. We're like, great, give me the future that makes perfect sense. And the concern is just like, do we get there by having an AI, which is instead of making the world make sense, is messing with our ability to understand what's happening in the world. Mm. So we just like see the kind of thing we wanted to see or expected to see. Um, and that's kind of what I expect to the extent that like we're in an outer alignment failure scenario. That's kind of what I expect failures to ultimately look like. Okay. Yeah. So, so in the realm of things roughly like outer alignment or, you know, sort of alignment, you know, dealing with low stakes, repeatable problems or something. Um, what, what kind of solutions are you most interested in from a research perspective? I don't have a very short answer to this question, so I guess you'll get a kind of long answer to this question. That in itself is interesting, I think. <laughs> yeah, and maybe there's also two kinds of answers I can give. One is like the thing that I am most animated by, that like I am working on myself. Another is like a broader, like here, kind of the things people do in the world that I'm particularly excited by amongst mm. existing research directions. Maybe my default would be to like go through some of the things people do in the world that I'm excited by and then turn to the thing I'm most animated by. But I'd be happy to do the other order if that seems better. Uh, let's try the first order. I guess one thing that seems like it comes up constantly as a useful building block or like an essential ingredient in many possible plans and seems tractable to work on but seems really hard is interpretability. So we're very frequently in a situation where we've trained some very large neural network. We know that it's able to make good predictions in some domain, um, and we're not really able to understand like what it knows about that domain. Um, sometimes we're able to like play some clever game and say something about why it's making the prediction it's making, or what kind of thing it knows about or doesn't know about. But for the most part, our methods there are very similar to just like doing some kind of behavioral analysis, where we're like, oh, if you change this part of the input, it gets it wrong. So apparently that's what it's paying attention to. I think there's some hope for techniques that are like more mechanically looking at what computation is performed by the model and then somehow understanding something about what it has learned so that you can better understand whether the like predictions it's making are reasonable, etc. So I guess that's just something I'm quite interested in um, to the extent that we're able to make headway on it. Okay. And how, how does that help in these like outer alignment type settings? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing is that like imagine your model again, which is predicting videos from the future. Mm. And you'd like to distinguish the case where actually everything in the future is great versus the case where actually the future is terrible, but like there's like a nice little village set up in front of the camera. We're concerned about models which like sort of are deliberately obfuscating what's happening on camera. That is AIs which are deliberately planning to put up the nice little village. They're building the houses, they're ensuring the camera doesn't go out of the village, whatever. Yep. This is a very crude metaphor, but the AI which is deliberately doing that, which is like choosing actions from this tiny space of actions to engineer this very specific outcome, in some sense, like somewhere deep in its heart, it understands like a lot of what's happening in the world. It understands like that if the camera turned just this way, it would see something objectionable. So don't let it do that. Um, and so it feels like if you have, in some sense, it doesn't even feel like that much to ask of your interpretability tools to be able to reach inside and be like, oh, okay, now if we look at what it's thinking, we see that clearly there's this disconnect between what's happening in the world and what's reported to the human. And I don't think there are that many credible approaches for that kind of problem other than some kind of headway on interpretability. So yeah, I guess that's my sort of story about how it helps. Okay. I think there's several, there's many possible stories about how it helps. Um, that's the one I'm personally most interested in. All right, so that's one approach that you like. I mean, I think in terms of what research people might do, I'm just generally very interested in taking a task that is challenging for humans in some way and to trying to train AI systems to do that task and seeing what works well, seeing how we can help humans push beyond their naive like ability to evaluate or like their native ability to evaluate proposals from an AI. And tasks can be hard for humans in lots of ways. Like you can imagine having like lay humans evaluating sort of expert human answers to questions and saying, how can we like build an AI that helps expose like this kind of expertise to a lay human? Like the interesting thing is the case where you don't have any trusted humans who have that expertise, where like we as a species are looking at our AI systems and they have expertise that no humans have. All right. And we can try and sort of study that today by saying like, imagine a case where the humans who are training the AI system lack some expertise that other humans have. And that gives us like a nice little warm up environment in some sense. Okay. Um, like we can say like, you can have the experts come in and say, how well did you do? How well? Like, you have gold gold standard answers, unlike in the final case. There's other ways tasks can be hard for humans. You can also consider tasks that are, like, computationally demanding or involve, like, lots of input data, um, tasks that are sort of where human abilities are artificially restricted in some way. Like, you can imagine, like, people who can't see are training an ImageNet model to, like, tell them about <laughs> scenes in natural language. Okay. And, like, 
again, the, the model is like, there are no humans who can see, but like you could ask, like, can we study this in some domain? Or the analogy would be that there's no humans who can see. Anyway, so there's, I think, a whole class of problems there. And then there's like a broader distribution or what techniques you would use for attacking those problems. I am very interested in techniques where AI systems are helping humans do the evaluation. So kind of imagine this like gradual inductive process where like, as your AI gets better, they help the humans answer harder and harder questions, which provides training data to allow the AIs to get ever better. I'm pretty interested in those kinds of approaches, which like, yeah, there are a bunch of different versions or a bunch of different things along those lines. Maybe there's a second category, so we had interpretability. We had this like using AIs to help train AIs. Yeah. Um, there was also think, what you were working on. I don't know if oh, yeah. that Maybe might the be last that. category I'd give was just like, I think even again in this sort of more like imitation learning regime or in the regime where humans can tell what is good, yep. like doing things effectively, like learning from small amounts of data, learning policies that are like just higher quality. That also seems valuable. I am more optimistic about that problem getting easier as AI systems improve, which is the main reason I'd be like less, I'm less scared of our failure to solve that problem than failure to solve the other two problems. And then maybe the fourth category is just like, I do think there's a lot of room for sitting around and thinking about things. I mean, I'll describe what I'm working on, which is a particular flavor of sitting around and thinking about things. Sure. Um, but there's lots of flavors of sitting around and thinking about like, how would we address alignment that I'm pretty interested in? All right. On to the stuff that I'm thinking about. Let's go. So I'd say at a really high level, and my attempt to summarize my current high level hope slash plan slash whatever, we're concerned about the case where we learn SGD or stochastic gradient descent finds some AI system that sort of embodies useful knowledge about the world or about how to think or useful heuristics for thinking, or whatever, and also uses it in order to achieve some end, like it has beliefs and then it selects the action that it expects will lead to a certain kind of consequence. At a really high level, what we'd like to do is we'd like to, instead of learning like a package which potentially couples that knowledge about the world with some like intention that we don't like, we like to just throw out the intention and learn just like the interesting knowledge about the world. And then we can, if we desire, like point that in the direction of like actually helping humans get what they want. At a high level, the thing I'm spending my time on is like going through examples of the kinds of things that I think gradient descent might learn, for which it's very hard to do that decoupling. And then for each of them saying, okay, what is our best hope? Or like, how could we modify gradient descent so that it could learn the like decoupled version of this thing? And I can, yeah, the sort of organized around examples of like cases where that seems challenging and what the problems seem to be there. Like right now, the particular instance that I'm thinking about most and have been for like the last three months, six months, um, is the case where you learn either facts about the world or a model of the world which are defined not in terms of like human abstractions, but some different set of abstractions. Okay. So as a very simple example, it's fairly unrealistic. You might imagine humans thinking about the world in terms of like people and cats and dogs. And you might imagine a model which instead thinks about the world in terms of like atoms bouncing around. So the concerning case is when we have this kind of mismatch between the way your beliefs or your simulation or whatever of the world operates and the way that human preferences are defined, such that it is then easy to take this model and use it to say plan for goals that are defined in terms of concepts that are natural to it but much harder to use it to plan in terms of concepts that are natural to humans okay. so i can like have my model of atoms bouncing around and i can say great search over actions and find the action that results in like the fewest atoms in this room and it's like great and then i can just enumerate a bunch of actions and find the one that results in the minimal atoms but if yeah. i'm like search for one where the humans are happy it's like i'm sorry i don't know i don't know what you mean about humans or happiness and like this is kind of a subtle case to talk about because actually that system can totally carry on a conversations about humans or happiness. That mm -hmm. is like, at the end of the day, there's these observations. We can train our AI systems to make predictions of like, what are the actual bits that are gonna be output by this camera? Yeah. And so it can predict like human faces, like walking around and humans saying words. It can predict humans talking about all the concepts they care about. And it can predict pictures of cats and it can predict a human saying like, yep, that's a cat. And the concern is more that basically you have your system which thinks natively in terms of like atoms bouncing around or some other abstractions. And mm -hmm. when you ask it to talk about cats or people, instead of getting it talking about actual cats or people, you get it talking about like when a human would say there is a cat or a person. And then if you optimize like, you're like I would like a situation where all the humans are happy, what you instead get is like a situation where they're happy humans on camera. And so you end up back in the same kind of concern that you could have had of like your AI system optimizing to mess with your ability to perceive the world rather than actually making the world good. So um, when you say this, that you, you would like this kind of decoupling, so that, that's a case where it's hard to do the decoupling. What's like a good example of like, yeah, here we like decoupled the motivation from the beliefs and now I can, you know, insert my favorite motivation and press go or whatever. What what does that look like? 
so I think a central example for me, or maybe, yeah, an example I like would be a system which has some beliefs about the world, like represented in a language you're familiar with. They don't even have to be represented that way natively. Consider an AI system which learned a bunch of facts about the world, learned some like procedure for deriving new facts from old facts, and learned how to convert whatever it observed into some facts. Like it learned some maybe opaque model that just converts what I observed into facts about the world. It then combines them with some of the facts that it's that are baked into it by gradient descent. And then it turns the crank on these inference rules to derive a bunch of new facts. And then at the end, having derived a bunch of facts, it just tries to find an action such that it's a fact that that action leads to the reward button being pushed or whatever. So this is like a way you could imagine. I mean, it's a very unrealistic way for an AI to work. Um, just as basically every example we can describe in a small number of words is a very unrealistic way for a deep neural network to work. Once I have that model, I could hope to, instead of having a system which turns the crank, derives a bunch of facts, and then looks up a particular kind of fact, and then takes, uses it to take an action, instead it starts from the statements, turns the crank, and then just answers questions, or basically directly reports, like translates the statements in its internal language into natural language. If I had that, then instead of searching over the action that leads to the reward button being pressed, I can search over a bunch of actions for each of them, like look at the beliefs it outputs in order to assess how good the world is, and then search for one where the world is good according to humans. And so the key dynamic is like, how do I expose like all this, this turning the crank on facts? How do I expose the facts it produces to like humans in a form that's usable for humans? And this brings us back to like amplification or debate, like these two techniques that I've worked on in the past in this genre of like AI helping humans evaluate AI behavior. Yeah. Right. A way we could hope to train an AI to do that. We could hope to have almost exactly the same process of SGD that produced the original reward button maximizing system. We'd hope to, instead of training it to maximize the reward button, we are going to train it to give answers that humans like, or answers that humans consider good and useful, like accurate and useful. And the way humans are going to supervise it is basically following along stepwise with the sort of deductions it's performing as it like turns this crank of driving new facts from old facts. So like it had some facts at the beginning. Uh, maybe a human can directly supervise those. We can talk about the case where the human doesn't know them, which I think is handled in a broadly similar way. And then like as it performs more and more steps of deduction, it's able to output more and more facts. But if a human is able to see the facts that it had after like n minus one steps, then mm. it's much easier for a human to evaluate some proposed fact at the nth step. So you could hope to have this kind of evaluation scheme where like the human is incentivizing the system to report like knowledge about the world or whatever. And then however the system was able to originally derive the knowledge in order to take some action in the world, the system can also derive that knowledge in the service of making statements that a human regards as like useful and accurate. So that's like kind of a typical example. All right. And, and, and the idea is that like, instead of like, like for whatever task we might have wanted an AI system to achieve, we just like train a system like this. And then we're like, how do I do the right thing? And then it just tells us. And ideally it doesn't require like really fast motors or appendages that humans don't have, or we know how to build them or something. And it just like gives us some instructions and then we do it. And that, that's how we get whatever thing we wanted out of the AI. Yeah, we want to take some care to make everything like really competitive. So probably we want to use this to get a reward function that we use to train our AI rather than trying to use it to like output instructions that a human executes. And we want to be okay. careful about there's a lot of details there and like not ending up with something that's a lot slower than the unaligned AI would have been. Okay. But I think this is a kind of case where I'm sort of optimistic about being able to say like, look, we can decouple like the rules of inference that it uses to derive new statements and like the statements it started out believing. We can decouple that stuff from the like decision at the very end to like take the state particular statement had derived and use that as a basis for action. So going back a few steps. So you were talking about, you know, cases where you could and couldn't do the decoupling and you're worried about some cases where you couldn't do the decoupling and you're yeah, I was wondering how that connects to your research. Like are you're just thinking about those or do you have ideas for algorithms to deal with them or Yeah, so I I mentioned the central case we're thinking about is kind of this like a mismatch between a way that your AI most naturally is said to be thinking about what's happening, yep. like a way the AI is thinking about what's happening, and the way a human would think about what's happening. The way, I think that kind of seems to me right now, like, a very central difficulty. I think maybe if I just describe it, it sounds like, well, sometimes you get really lucky and your AI can be thinking about things as just in a different language, and that's the only difficulty. I, I currently think that's a pretty central case, um, or handling that case is quite important. The algorithm we're thinking about most, or like the family of algorithms we're thinking about most for handling that case is basically defining an objective over some correspondence or some translation between how your AI thinks about things and how the human thinks about things. The conventional way to define that maybe would be to just like have a bunch of labeled human labeling like there was a cat, there was a dog, whatever. The concern with that is that you get this like, instead of saying was there actually a cat, it's translating like does a human think there's a cat. So the main idea is to use objectives other than they're like not just a function of what it outputs. Like they're not the supervised objective of how well its outputs match human outputs. 
You have other properties like you can have regularization, like how fast is that correspondence or um, how simple is that correspondence. I think that's okay. still not good enough. You could have like consistency checks, like saying, well, it said A and it said B, and we're not sure, we're not able to label either A or B, but we understand that like that combination of A and B is inconsistent. This is still not good enough. And so then most of the time has gone into ideas that are like basically taking those consistency conditions. So saying we expect that like when there's a bark, it's most likely there was a dog. We think mm -hmm. that like the model's outputs should also have that property. Then trying to look at like what is the actual fact about the model that led to that consistency condition being satisfied and having an objective that depends on this kind of like, I think this gets us a little bit back into like mechanistic transparency hopes, mechanistic okay. interpretability hopes, where like the objective actually depends on like why that consistency condition was satisfied. So you're not just saying like, great, you said that it, there's more likely to be a dog barking when there was a dog in the room. We're saying like, it is better if that relationship, like if that's because of a single weight in your neural network or whatever, that's like this very extreme case. That's a very okay. extremely simple explanation for why that correlation occurred. And we could have a more general objective that cares about like the nature of the explanation, that cares about okay. like, why that correlation existed. Or, or the idea is that we want the, these like consistency checks, we want them to be passed, not because like we were just lucky with what situations we looked at but like actually the model is like so, some other structure is that it's reliably going to produce things that are right and we can tell because what the because we can figure out what things the consistency checks passing are due to is that right that's the kind of thing yeah okay. and i think it ends up being or it has been a long journey hopefully there's a long journey that will go somewhere good uh right now that is up in the air uh, but like some of the early candidates would be things like this explanation could be very simple so instead of asking for the correspondence itself to be simple ask for like uh, the reasons that these consistency checks are satisfied are very simple. Like it's more like one weight in a neural net rather than like some really complicated correlation that came from the input. You could also ask for like that correlation to depend as little as possible or like on as few facts as possible about the input or about the neural network. Okay. Um, I think none of these quite work. And getting to where we're actually at would be kind of a mess. But that's the research program. It's mostly sitting around, <laughs> thinking hmm. about objectives of this form, having an inventory of cases that seem like really challenging cases for any for finding this correspondence um, and trying to understand, like adding new objectives into the, the library and then trying to like refine, like here are all these candidates, here are all these hard cases. How do we turn this into something that actually works in all the hard cases? Um, it's very much sitting by a whiteboard. It is a big change from my old life until like one year ago, I basically just wrote code or I spent years mostly writing code. Sure. And now I just stare at whiteboards. All right, so changing gears a little bit. Um, I think you're most perhaps well known for this kind of factored cognition approach to AI alignment that, that somehow involves decomposing a particular task into a bunch of subtasks um, and then like training systems to like basically do the decomposition kind of. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how that fits into your view of like which problems exist and what you what your current thoughts are on this broad strategy. Yeah, so I guess factored cognition refers to, or like the factored cognition hypothesis was what Ott, a nonprofit I worked with, was calling this hope that arbitrarily complex tasks can be broken down into simpler pieces and so on ad infinitum, potentially at a very large slowdown. And this is relevant on a bunch of possible approaches to AI alignment. It's if you imagine that you're trying to train, if humans and AI systems are trying to train AIs to do a sequence of increasingly complex tasks, um, but you're only comfortable doing this training, when the human and their AI assistance is at least as smart as the AI they're about to train, then you kind of like, if you just play training backwards, you basically have this decomposition of the most challenging task your AI was ever able to do into simpler and simpler pieces. And so I'm mostly interested in like tasks which cannot be done by any amount, like sort of any number of humans with however long they're willing to spend during training are very hard to do by any of these approaches, it seems. So this is like for... AI safety via debate, where I hope is you have several AIs arguing about what the right answer is. Uh, it's true for like iterated distillation and amplification, where you kind of have a human with these assistants training another, a sequence of increasingly strong AIs. And it's true for like recursive reward modeling, which is, uh, I guess, an agenda that came from a paper out of DeepMind, I guess by Jan Leike, who took over for me at OpenAI, um, where you're sort mm. of trying to define a sequence of like reward functions for more and more complex tasks. Uh, using assistance trained on the preceding reward functions. Anyway, it seems like all of these approaches run into this kind of common, there's an upper bound that's, of the, I think it was an upper bound, I think other people might dispute this, but I would think it was a crude upper bound based on everything you ever train an AI to do in any of these ways can be broken down into smaller pieces until it's ultimately broken down into pieces that a human can do on their own. And sometimes that can be non-obvious. I think it's worth pointing out that like 
search can be trivially broken down into simpler pieces. Like if a human can recognize a good answer, then a large enough number of humans can do it, just because you can have a ton of humans doing a bunch of things until you find a good answer. I think my current take would be, like, I think it has always been the case that you can learn stuff that is not really, like you can, you can learn stuff about the world, which you could not have derived by breaking down the question, like, what is the height of the Eiffel Tower into simpler and simpler questions? The only way you're going to learn that is by going out and looking at the height of the Eiffel Tower. Um, or maybe doing some crazy simulation of Earth from the dawn of time. And like ML in particular is going to learn a bunch of those things, or gradient descent is going to bake a bunch of facts like that into your neural network. So if this task, if doing what the ML does is decomposable, it would have to be through humans looking at all of that training data somehow, looking at all of the training data which the ML system ever saw while it was trained, and like drawing their own conclusions from that. I think that is, in some sense, very realistic, and that like a lot of humans can really do a lot of things. But for all of these approaches I listed, when you're doing these task decompositions, it's not only the case that you decompose the final task the AI does into simpler pieces, yep. you decompose it into simpler pieces, all of which the AI is also able to perform. Um, and so learning, I think, doesn't have that feature. That is, I think you can decompose learning in some sense into smaller pieces, but they're not pieces that the final learned AI was able to perform. Right? The learned AI is an AI which like knows facts about the Eiffel Tower. It doesn't know yep. facts about like how to go look at like Wikipedia articles and learn something about the Eiffel Tower necessarily. So I guess now I think these approaches that rely on factor cognition, I now most often think of sort of having both the humans decomposing tasks into smaller pieces, but also having like a separate search that runs in parallel with gradient descent. Um, so I guess I wrote a post on, and then Beth wrote an explainer on imitative generalization a while mm. ago. The idea here is imagine instead of like your decomposing tasks into tiny sub pieces that a human can do, we're going to learn like a big reference manual to hand to a human or something like that. And like we're going to use gradient descent to find the reference manual that when you give it to like for any given reference manual, you can imagine handing it to humans and saying, hey human, trust the outputs from this manual. Just believe it was written by someone benevolent wanting you to succeed at the task. Now using that, do whatever you want in the world. And that was a bigger set of tasks the human can do after you've handed them this reference manual. Like it might say like the height of the Eiffel Tower is whatever. And the idea in imitative generalization is just Instead of searching over a neural network, this is very related to the spirit of like the coupling I was talking about before. Instead of searching over a neural network, we're kind of going to search over like a reference manual that we want to give to a human. And then instead of decomposing our t final task into pieces that a human can do unaided, we're going to decompose our final task into pieces that a human can do using this reference manual. So you might imagine then that like sort of stochastic gradient descent bakes in a bunch of facts about the world into this reference manual. These are sort of things the neural network just knows. And then we give those to a human and we say like, go do what you will like taking all of these facts as given, and now the human can do some bigger set of tasks or answer a bunch of questions they otherwise wouldn't have been able to answer. And then we can get an objective for this reference manual. So if we're producing the reference manual by stochastic gradient descent, we need some objective to actually optimize. And the proposal for the objective is give that reference manual to some humans, ask them to do the task or to like the large team of humans to eventually break down the task of predicting the next word of a web page or whatever it is that your neural network was going to be trained to do. Look at how well the humans do at that predict the next word task. And then instead of optimizing your neural network by stochastic gradient descent in order to make good predictions, optimize that like whatever reference manual you're giving a human by gradient descent in order to cause it to make humans make good predictions. So like that's, I guess the factor cognition hypothesis as stated, like that doesn't change the factor cognition hypothesis as stated because this search is also just something which can be very easily split across humans. You're just saying like loop over all of the reference manuals and for each one run the entire process. But I think in flavor, it's like pretty different in that you're not, you don't have like your trained AI doing any one of those subtasks. Some of those subtasks are now being paralyzed like across the steps of gradient descent or whatever, or across mm. the different models being considered in gradient descent. And that is most often the kind of thing I'm thinking about now. And that suggests this other question of like, okay, now we need to make sure that gradient descent over, like if your reference manual is just text, yeah. how big is that manual going to be compared to the size of your neural network? And can you search over it as easily as you can search over your neural network? I think the answer in general is like, you're completely screwed if that neural network, if that manual is in text. So we mentioned earlier that it's not obvious that humans can't just do all the tasks you want to apply AI to. You could imagine a world where we're just applying AI to tasks where humans are able to evaluate the outputs. Yeah. And in some sense, everything we're talking about is just extending that range of tasks to which we can apply AI systems. Um, and so breaking tasks down into subtasks that AI can perform is sort of one way of extending the range of tasks. Now we're basically looking not at tasks that a single human can perform, but that some large team of humans can perform. And then adding this reference manual does further extend the set of tasks that a human can perform. 
I think if you're clever, it sort of extends it to like the set of tasks where like what the neural net learned can be cached out as this kind of like declarative knowledge that's in your reference manual. But like maybe not that surprisingly, that does not extend it all the way. Like text is limited compared to the kinds of knowledge you can represent in a neural network. And so maybe this is like the current, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about now. Okay. And what's, what's a limitation of text versus what you could potentially represent? So if you imagine you have your billion parameter neural network, um, I mean, a simple example is just like, if you imagine that neural network doing some simulation, representing the simulation it wants to do, like it's like, oh yeah, if there's an atom here, there should be an atom there in the next time step. That simulation is described by like these billion numbers and searching over a reference manual big enough to contain a billion numbers is a lot harder than searching over a neural network, like a billion weights of a neural network. Um, and more brutally, like a human who has that simulation in some sense, like doesn't really know enough to actually do stuff with it. They can tell you where the atoms are, but they can't tell you where the humans are. That's one example. Another is just like, suppose there's some correlation between, or there's like some complicated set of correlations, or like you might think of things that are more like skills will tend to have this feature more. Like if like I'm an image classification model, I know that like that particular kind of curve is really often associated with like something being part of a book. I can describe that in words, but like it gets blown up a lot in the translation process to words. Um, and it becomes harder to search over. So the things we've talked about have mostly been your thoughts about like sort of objectives to give AI systems. Um, and so more in this like outer alignment style stage. Um, I'm wondering for inner alignment style problems where it's like the AI system has some objective and you want to make sure it like, you know, it's really devoted to pursuing that objective, even if like the situation changes or even in the worst case or, yeah. You know. Um, I'm wondering like if you have thoughts on solutions you're particularly keen on in those settings. Yes, yeah, so I think I have two categories of response. One is like technical research we can do that helps with this kind of inner alignment slash catastrophic failures slash out of distribution, that cluster of problems across the board or in many possible worlds. And then another is like in my kind of preferred or like assuming my research project was successful, like how would this how would this be handled on that? Um, and maybe again, I'll start with like what people are doing that seems helpful. Yeah, so I think the most basic thing I'm excited about is just generating hard cases and throwing hard cases at your AI. So if you imagine you have some AI system, you're like, I'm concerned that on some very rare inputs, the AI system may decide that it's time to kill all humans. I'm like, mm. well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and generate the kinds of inputs that might convince my AI to kill all humans. And like, hopefully, if I try a really long time and I can't find any, then it's less likely we're going to encounter any out there in the real world. Yeah, and the theory is that it's in some sort of like safe box so that if you succeed at your search, the AI does not in fact kill all the humans. Yeah. So there's this distinction where like when training an AI I may often need to see the consequences of its actions. Whereas for this kind of training, I wouldn't want to be running the things my AI proposes and checking the consequences, okay. hopefully. Um, so there's more subtleties there, definitely. But yeah, we're not actually doing the things the AI suggests. We just like observe it takes an action. This is sort of assuming we can... So it takes an action without... It quote unquote takes an action, yeah. but it doesn't like actually... Yeah, it outputs take the action. an action. And then there's no actuators to which the action can get sent. Okay. Um, like we're imagining some AI, which we might ultimately hook up to the internet. But right now we look at the proposed internet actions and we're like, do those seem good? And the hope is we've solved sort of what I'm filing more under the outer alignment side of being able to assess for given proposed action, would that action be catastrophically bad? We can make predictions about that, like as well as the AI. So in particular, if the AI has calculated that this action will lead to like a robot uprising, killing all humans, then we can like look at the action and be like, actually, this is not a good action. And then ding our AI. So if you have that ability, then you can try in your little sandbox to throw tons of actions or tons of situations at your AI and see if it ever proposes any actions that look like they would be really bad. I think that feels like the basic, most basic ingredient. That does not seem sufficient. I guess the basic reason it doesn't seem sufficient is that even if bad cases exist, it can be really hard to find them. So you kind of want to, from there, make the job. So you imagine this adversary is trying to break your model and trying to get it to do something bad. You yeah. kind of want to make their job as easy as you can possibly make it. So an example would be like, instead of having them actually like provide inputs to your system, maybe you let them go in and like monkey around with some of the neurons in the system and be like, okay, I can't actually find an input that causes this neuron to fire, but if I could, yeah, then like yeah. the AI would do this bad thing. Um, and that becomes quite subtle because as I'm monkeying around with the neurons, eventually it becomes unclear. Like right when I had an input, I could see like, okay, my AI sees the following web page and then it responds by sending the following packet. And I can tell that like, that was a really bad thing. That would be a really bad thing for it to do. Um, like it replied to the help wanted ad for like, whatever, someone running their robot rebellion. It's harder if I'm like monkeying with its neurons and I see that it like outputs a given packet. I'm like, I don't necessarily know what state of the world corresponded to those neurons being in that configuration. 
It's like there certainly are states of the world where it's like good to send for almost any action. There's like a state of the world in which it's good to do that action. And in particular, like bad actions may not look that bad. They're just bad because of like details of the context. And so if I got the eye to take some action by monkeying with its neurons, it's a little bit unclear how I say like, was that action actually bad or not? Mm. Um, that's the kind of, you want to sort of give your adversary that kind of ability in order to help them like make it easier for them to show like, well, here's a case where I could do something bad. I can't actually find the input, but like you should be scared because it seems like this could happen. Um, and you also want to give them like interpretability tools. I want them to be able to understand what the AI is thinking and to say like, oh, it looks like the AI is like checking if any humans are watching and doing something nice if they are. So let's just like really optimize on that to find a case where it thinks there's no humans watching and then see if it's still nice. Like that's sort of a cluster of techniques, all of which are designed to like help you really hammer at like, are there cases where this AI might do something bad? Can we find them? If we can find them, then we can train on them. Before we actually take the action, we can provide a gradient saying, like, don't do something that's really bad in that hypothetical case. And those kind of blur pretty continuously into, like, verification stuff in my mind. That is, like, verification is in some sense some kind of limit of, like, being willing to monkey with the neurons and then having some, some formal specification for how much the adversary is allowed to monkey with the neurons. Yeah, that's a category of, like, I think all of those are sort of research directions that people pursue for a variety of motivations out there in the world. Um, and I'm pretty excited about a lot of that work. And uh, on your favorite approaches, how, how does this pan out? So I mentioned before this kind of hoped for decoupling, where I'd say we're concerned about the case where we learn some AI that is gradient descent finds a neural network, which is trying to figure out how to mess with the humans. Um, and then when an opportunity comes along, it's going to mess with the humans. And like in some sense, the nicest thing to do is to say, okay, the reason we wanted that AI was just because it encodes some knowledge about like how to do useful stuff in the world. And so what we'd like to do is to say, okay, we are going to set things up so that it's easier for gradient descent to learn just the knowledge about how to behave well in the world rather than to like learn that knowledge embedded within an agent that's trying to screw over humans. And that is hard, or it seems quite hard, but I think that is, I guess sort of the biggest challenge in my mind to this decoupling of outer and inner alignment is that this seems like almost necessary either for a full solution to outer alignment or a full solution to inner alignment. Hmm. So I kind of expect to be more in the trying to kill two birds with one stone regime. And these are like the kinds of examples of decoupling we described before. Like we hope we train some AI, which is right. You hope the only have to use gradient descent to find this reference manual. And then from there you can like much more easily pin down what all the other behaviors should be. And then you hope that reference manual is like smaller than the like scheming AI, which has all of the like knowledge in that reference manual baked into its brain. Yeah, it's very unclear if that can be done. I think it's also fairly likely that in the end that they just don't know how that looks. And it's fairly likely in the end that has to be coupled with some more normal, more normal measures like verification or adversarial training. All right. So I'd like to now talk a little bit about your research style. So you mentioned that um, as of recently, the way you do research is you sit in a room and you think about some stuff. Is there any chance you can give us more detail on that? So I think the basic organizing framework uh, is something like, we have some current set of algorithms and techniques that we'd use for alignment. Step one is try and dream up some situation in which your AI would try and kill everyone despite your best efforts using all the existing techniques. So like a situation describing, like, we're worried that here's the kind of thing gradient descent might most easily learn, and here's the way the world is such that the thing gradient descent learned tries to kill everyone. And here's why you couldn't have gotten away with learning something else instead. Mm. Like we tell some story that culminates in doom, which is hard to avoid using existing techniques. That's like step one. Step two is like, maybe there's some step 1.5 is like trying to strip that story down to like the simplest moving parts that feel like, like the simplest sufficient conditions for doom. Then step two is trying to design some algorithm, like just thinking about only that case. I mean, like in that case, what do we want to happen? Like what would we like gradient descent to learn instead? Or how would we like to use the learned model instead or whatever? What is our algorithm that addresses that case? And there's been a lot, like, you know, the last three months have just been working on a very particular case where I currently think existing techniques would lead to doom, sort of along the kinds of lines we've been talking about, with, like grabbing the camera or whatever, and trying to come up with some algorithm that works well in that case. And then I guess step three, like if you succeed, then uh, you get to move on to step three, where you like look again over all of your cases, you look over all your algorithms. You probably try and say something about like, can we unify? Like we know what we want to happen in all of these particular cases. Can we design one algorithm that does that right thing in all the cases? For me, that step is like mostly a formality at this stage, or like it's not very important at this stage. Mostly just go back to step one. Once you have your new algorithm, then you go back to like, okay, what's the new case that we don't handle? And like normally, I am just like pretty lax about the plausibility of the doom stories that I'm thinking about at this stage. That is, I have some optimism that, like, 
in the end, we'll have an algorithm that results in your AI just never deliberately trying to kill you. Okay. Um, and it's actually, hopefully, will end up being very hard to tell a story about how your AI ends up trying to kill you. And so while I have this hope, I'm kind of just willing to say, like, oh, here's a wild case. So, like, a very unrealistic thing that gradient descent might learn. But that's still, like, enough of a challenge that I want to change or, like, design an algorithm that addresses that case. Because I hope it's, like, working with really simple cases like that helps guide us towards, like, if there's any nice, simple algorithm that never tries to kill you, thinking about the simplest cases you can is just, like, a nice, easy way to make progress towards that. Yeah, so I guess most of the action then is in, like, what do we actually do in steps one and two. Yeah. Uh, but at high level, that's, like, what, that's what I'm doing all the time. And is there anything, like, you can broadly say about what happens in steps one or two? Or do you think that, like, depends a lot on uh, the day or the research Yeah, problem? I guess in step one, the biggest thing is, like, what... I think the main question people have is, like, what is the story like? Like, what are, what is the type signature of that object? Or, like, what is it written out in words? And hmm. I think, like, most often I'm, like, writing down some simple pseudocode and I'm, like, here is the code that your AI could learn. Like, here is, like, the code you could imagine your neural network executing. Um, and then I'm telling some simple story about the world where I'm like, oh, actually, you live in a world which is governed by the following laws of physics and, like, the following, like, actors or whatever. And, like, in that world, this program is actually, like, pretty good. And then I'm like, here is some assumption about how SGD works that's consistent with everything we know right now. Very often, like, well, we think SGD will find, like, could find any program that's, like, the simplest program that achieves a given loss or something. So, like, the story, yeah, is really has, like, the sketch of, like, some code, and, like, often that code will have some question marks where I'm, like, looks like you could fill those in to make the story work. Some description of the environment, some description of, like, facts about gradient descent. And then we'll be bouncing back and forth between that and, like, working on the algorithm. Working on the algorithm, I guess, is more like, uh, right, at the end of the day, most of the algorithms take the form of, here's an objective, try minimizing this with gradient descent. <laughs> so basically the algorithm is, like, here's an objective, and then you, like, look at your story and you're, like, okay, on the story, is it plausible that minimizing this objective leads to this thing? Or, like, Often part of the algorithm is like, and here is the good thing we hope that you would learn instead of that bad thing. Yep. Like in your original story, you have your AI that like loops over actions till it finds one that it predicts leads to smiling human faces on camera. Yep. You're like, that's bad because in this world we've created like the easiest way to get smiling human faces on camera involves killing everyone and putting smiles in front of the camera. And they're like, what we want to happen instead is like this other algorithm I mentioned where it like outputs everything it knows about the world and we hope that includes like the fact that the humans are dead. So then a proposal will involve like some way of operationalizing like what that means, like what it means for it to output what it knows about the world for this particular bad algorithm that's like doing a simulation or whatever that we imagined. And then what objective you would optimize with gradient descent that would give you like this good program that you wanted instead of the bad one you didn't want. Okay. The next kind of question I'd like to ask is like, what do you see as like the most important big picture disagreements you have with people who already believe that like AI you know, advanced AI technology might pose some kind of existential risk and, like, we should, like, we should really worry about that and try to work to prevent that. Broadly, I think there are two categories of disagreements where, like, I'm kind of flanked on two different sides. Okay. One is by, like, the sort of more Machine Intelligence Research Institute-like crowd, which yep. has, like, a very pessimistic view about the feasibility of alignment and what it's going to take to build AI systems that aren't trying to kill you. And then hmm. on the other hand, by, like, researchers who tend to be more at, like, ML labs would tend mm. to be more in the camp of, like, it would be really surprising if AI trained with, like, this technique actually was trying to kill you. And there's nuances to both of those disagreements. Maybe you could split the second one into, like, one category that's more like, actually, this problem isn't that hard, and we need to be good at, like, the basics in order to survive. Like, the gravest risk is that we mess up the basics. And a second camp being, like, actually, we have no idea what's going to be hard about this problem, and what it's mostly about is getting set up to, like, collect really good data as soon as possible so that we can adapt to what's actually happening. It's also worth saying that it's unclear often which of these are empirical disagreements versus like methodological differences where like I have my thing I'm doing and I think that like there's room for lots of people doing different things. So there are some empirical disagreements, but like not all the differences in what we do are explained by those differences versus some yep. of them being like Paul is a theorist who's going to do some theory and he's going to have like some methodology so he works on theory. And like I do, I'm excited about theory, but like it's not always the case that when I'm doing something theoretical, it's because I think the theoretical thing is, like, dominant. Okay, and then going into, like, in those disagreements, I guess, like, with the Miri folk, that's maybe more weedsy. doesn't have a super short description. We can return to it in a bit if we want. On the, like, people who are more optimistic side, I think for people who think existing techniques are more likely to be okay, I think the most common disagreement is about how crazy the tasks our AIs will be doing are, or, like, how alien will the reasoning of AI systems be. People who are more optimistic tend to be, like... 
AI systems will be operating at high speed and doing things that are maybe hard for humans or a little bit beyond the range of human abilities. Mm. But broadly, like humans will be able to understand the consequences of the actions they propose fairly well. They'll be able to fairly safely like look at an action, be like, can we run this action? They'll be able to get those AI systems help, like mostly leverage those AI systems effectively, even if the AI systems are just trying to do things that look good to humans. So often this is a disagreement about like, I'm imagining AI systems that reason in super alien ways and someone else is like, probably like it will mostly be thinking through consequences or like thinking in ways that are kind of legible to humans and thinking fast in ways that are legible to humans gets you a lot of stuff. I guess in some sense that view is like, I am very long on the like thinking fast in ways legible to humans is very powerful. Like I'm, I definitely yeah. believe that a lot more than most people. But I do think I often like now, especially because I'm like working on the more theoretical end, I'm often like thinking about all the cases where that doesn't work. Um, okay. Some people are more optimistic about like the cases where that works are enough, which is either about like an empirical claim about how AI will be, or sometimes like a social claim about how important it is to be competitive. Like okay. I think I really want to be able to build aligned AI systems that are economically competitive with unaligned AI, and I'm really scared of a world where there's a significant tension there. Whereas other people are more like, it's okay. It's okay if aligned AI systems are like a little bit slower or a little bit dumber. Like people are not going to want to destroy the world. And so they'll be willing to hold off a little bit on deploying some of these things. Um, and then on the empirical side, like people who think that like theoretical work is less valuable should be mostly focused on the empirics or just doing other stuff. I would guess like one common disagreement is just that I'm reasonably optimistic about being able to find something compelling on paper. So I think like this methodology I described of like try and find an algorithm for which it's hard to tell a story about how your AI ends up killing everyone. I actually expect that methodology to terminate with being like, yep, here was an algorithm. It looks pretty good to us. We can't tell a story about how it's uncompetitive or lethal. Whereas I think other people are like, that is extremely unlikely to be where that goes. That's just going to be years of you like going around in circles until eventually you give up. That's actually a common disagreement on both sides. That's probably also the core disagreement with Miri folks in some sense. Yeah. Uh, so you said uh, it was perhaps hard to concisely summarize your <laughs> differences between this sort of group of people centered perhaps at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, or MIRI for short. Yeah, could, could you try? So definitely the upshot is, yep. I am optimistic about being able to find an algorithm which can align deep learning, like a system which is closely analogous to and competitive with standard deep learning, whereas they are very pessimistic about the prospects for aligning anything that looks like contemporary deep learning. Uh -huh. um, that's kind of the upshot. Uh, so they're more in the mindset of like, Let's find any task you can do with anything, kind of like deep learning, and then be willing to take great pains and huge expense to do just that one task, and then hopefully like find a way to make the world okay after that, or maybe like build systems that are later build systems that are very unlike modern deep learning. Whereas I'm pretty optimistic. Or pretty optimistic means like I think there's a fifty fifty chance or something that we can have a nice algorithm that actually lets you basically do something like deep learning without it killing everyone. That's the upshot. And then the reason for it I think those are pretty weedsy. I guess intuitively it's something like, right, if you view the central claim as, or the central objective as about like decoupling and trying to learn like what your unaligned agent would have known, I think that like there are a bunch of possible reasons that that decoupling could be really hard. Like the fundamentally the like cognitive abilities and the like intentions could come as a package. Yeah. Um, this is also really core to Mary's disagreement with more conventional ML researchers who are like, why would you build an agent? Why not just build a thing that like helps you understand the world? Mm. Like, I think on the Mary view, it's like there's likely to be this like a really deep coupling between those things. And it's very unlikely that like I'm mostly working on other ways that decoupling can be hard besides like this kind of core one Mary has in mind. I think Mary is really into like there's some kind of core of being a fast, smart agent in the world. And that, yeah. like that core will come with like is really tied up with what you're using it for. It's not coherent to really talk about like being smart without developing that intelligence in the service of a goal or to talk about like factoring out the thing which you use to, yeah. There's some like kind of complicated philosophical beliefs about like the nature of intelligence, um, which I think, especially Eliezer is just like fairly confident in or he thinks it's like mostly pretty settled. Yeah, so I'd say that's probably the core disagreement. I think there's a secondary disagreement about just like how realistic is it to implement complex projects? Like, I think their take is, suppose Paul comes up with a good algorithm, even in that long shot, there's no way that's going to get implemented rather than just, like, something easier that destroys the world. Um, and that, like, projects fail the first time, and this is a case we have to get things right the first time. Well, that's a point of contention such that there's not, you're not going to have much of a chance. That's a secondary disagreement. And sort of related to that, I'm wondering, like, what, what do you think your most important uncertainties are 
uncertainty is such that if you resolve them, that would in a big way change either what you were, you know, motivated to do to reduce. Yeah, yeah. Let's say, let's say it would change what you were motivated to do in order to reduce existential risk from AI. Yeah. So maybe top four. One would be, is there some nice algorithm on paper that definitely doesn't result in your AI killing you? Okay. Um, and is definitely competitive. Or is this the kind of thing where, like, that's a pipe dream and you just need to have an algorithm that works in the real world? Yeah, I think that would just sort of have a kind of obvious impact on what I'm doing. Um, I think I'm reasonably optimistic about learning a lot about that over the coming years. Like, I think I've kind of been thinking recently that maybe by, like, end of 2022, if this isn't going anywhere, I'll pretty much know and can wind down the theory stuff. And hopefully, significantly before then, we'll have, like, big wins that make me feel more optimistic. So that's one uncertainty. Just, like, is this going to work, the thing I'm doing? A second big uncertainty is, like, is it the case that like existing best practices in alignment would suffice to align powerful AI systems or like would buy us enough time for AI to take over the alignment problem from us? Like I think eventually the AI will be doing alignment rather than us. And it's just a question of how late in the game does that happen and how far do existing alignment techniques carry us? I think it's fairly plausible that existing best practices, if implemented well by like a sufficiently competent team that cared enough about alignment would be sufficient to get a good outcome. And I think in that case, it becomes much more likely that instead of working on algorithms, I should be working on actually like bringing practice up to like the limits of what is known. Maybe I'll just do three, not four. Okay. And then three, like maybe this is a little bit more silly, but like I feel like legitimate moral uncertainty over like what kinds of AI, maybe the broader thing is just like how important is alignment relative to other risks. Hmm. I think one reason, one big consideration for the value of alignment is just like, how good is it if the AI systems take over the world from the humans? Where my like default inclination is like, that doesn't sound that good. Um, but like, it sounds a lot better than nothing in expectation, like than a barren universe. It would matter a lot. Like if I, if you convinced me that number was higher, at some point I would start working on like other risks associated with the transition to AI. That seems like the least likely of these uncertainties to actually get resolved. Sure. I find it kind of unlikely I'm going to move that much from where I am now, which is like, maybe it's half as good for AI to take over the world from humans as for humans to choose what happens in space. And that's like close enough to zero that like, I definitely want to work on alignment and close enough to one that I also definitely don't want to go extinct. So my penultimate question is, or it might be anti-penultimate depending on your answer, is, is there anything that I have not yet asked, but you think that I should have? It seems possible that I should have, as I gone, been like plugging all kinds of alignment research that's happening at all sorts of great organizations around the world. Okay. I haven't really done any of that. I'm really bad at that, though. All so right. I'm just going to forget someone and then feel tremendous guilt in my heart. Yeah, how about in order to keep this short and to limit your guilt, uh, what are the top like five people or organizations that you'd like to plug? Oh, man. That's just going to increase my guilt, because now I have to choose five. All right. <laughs> anyway, some people, I think, like, a lot Perhaps of... Perhaps name five. <laughs> yeah. Any five. Any five. I think there's, like, a lot of ML labs that are doing good work. Like, ML labs who view their goal as getting to powerful, transformative AI systems. Okay. Who are doing work on alignment. So that's, like, DeepMind, OpenAI, uh, Anthropic. I think all of them are, like, gradually converging to some kind of, like, set of, like, this gradual crystallization of what we all want to do. That's one. Maybe I'll do three things. Second can be, like, academics... There's a bunch of people, like, I don't know, I'm friends with Jacob at Berkeley. Um, I think Who's Jacob? Jacob Steinhardt. Okay. Um, who has, you know, and his students are working on, like, robustness issues with an eye towards long-term risks. A ton of researchers at your research organization, um, which I guess we probably talked about on other episodes. I've talked to some of them. I don't think we've talked about it as a whole. Yeah, it's the Center for Human Compatible AI. If people are interested. I guess they can go to humancompatible.ai to see a list of people associated with us and then you can for each person i guess you can look at all the work they did we might have a newsletter or something <laughs> i i did not prepare for this so. sorry for putting you on the spot with pitching yeah. no all i right. think i'm not going to do justice to the academics there's a bunch of academics often just like random individuals here and there with groups um doing a lot of interesting work and then there's kind of the weird ea nonprofits, weird effective altruist and like conventional AI alignment crowd nonprofits. probably the most salient to me there are redwood research it's very salient to yeah, me right now because I've been talking with them a bunch over the last few weeks. What are they? They're working on robustness broadly, so like this adversarial training stuff. How do you make your models definitely not do bad stuff on any input? Ought, which is a nonprofit that has been working on like how do you actually turn like large language models into tools that are useful for humans? And the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, uh, which is the most paranoid of all organizations about AI alignment. <laughs> 
okay. their core value added probably. Yeah. So maybe those are, there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work. I didn't plug them at all throughout the podcast, but I love them anyway. All right. So speaking of plugging things, uh, if people listen to this podcast and they're now interested in following you and your work, uh, what should they do? I write blog posts sometimes at ai-alignment.com. I sometimes publish to the Alignment Forum. And depending on how much you read, it may be your best bet to wait until spectacular, exciting results emerge, which will probably appear one of those places and also in print. But we've been pretty quiet over the last six months, definitely. And I expect to be expect to be pretty quiet for a while and then to have a big write-up of what we're basically doing and what our plan is sometime, I guess I don't know when this podcast is appearing, but sometime in like early 2022 or something like that. I also don't know when it's appearing. <laughs> we, we did date ourselves to, to infrastructure week, one of the highly specific times. Okay, well, uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. This episode is edited by Finn and Adamson, and Justice Mills helped with transcription. The financial costs of making this episode are covered by a grant from the Long-Term Future Fund. To read a transcript of this episode, or to learn how to support the podcast, you can visit axrp.net. That's A-X-R-P dot net. Finally, if you have any feedback about this podcast, you can email me at feedback at axrp.net.